um, good morning. Uh, Chaturi, could you hear me? Vihanga, could you hear me? Chaturi? Hello. Chatri, could you hear me? Yes, madam, we can hear you. Right. Uh, can, shall I come in? Yes, madam. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. We are to initiate the um, our post-Congress workshop on evidence-based practice for busy clinicians, a hands-on workshop. Uh, so initially, let me address Professor Kumara Mendes, Professor Shamila Adi Silva, uh, Dr. Shehan Silva, and all others. Uh, the hunger? Yeah, I'm extremely sorry, uh, Professor Kumara Mendes, Professor Shamila Adi Silva, Dr. Shahan Silva, uh, and all other uh, distinguished um, resource personals of the evidence-based practice for busy clinicians and hands-on workshop. All um, participants who have got connected online for this very important workshop uh, as the president, of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I welcome all of you for this platform organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association to uh, conduct the uh, professional uh, activities, uh, particularly to propagate the skills development of the medical profession. Uh, this workshop was supposed to be a post-Congress workshop, but uh, for the reasons that are beyond our control, like the COVID, we now are doing it and uh, our conference, 134th Anniversary International Conference uh, got postponed to uh, 23rd from uh, 21st to 24th of September, 2021. So uh, at this point of time, I invite all of you to get uh, registered for the uh, annual academic conference as well. Uh, and the academic uh, program that we have uh, developed for the annual scientific conference is uh, very exciting and uh, does cover a wide range of uh, uh, topics that are of national interest. So I'm certain that it would uh, be very useful for uh, all doctors. So with regard to evidence-based practice by uh, busy physicians, I mean, I know that this uh, box workshop is an outcome of the interest of Professor Kumar Mendes. Uh, I mean, uh, personally, I know that he is with vast experience in family medicine and uh, he, he has his interests and he takes active role in propagating all his interests. Uh, and he had been a council mem member of the Sri Lanka Medical Association as well. So uh, I'm very thankful to Professor Kumar Mendes for selecting uh, SLM to conduct this uh, uh, most useful uh, academic program for uh, medical professionals. Uh, I welcome this workshop very much, uh, particularly during this uh, COVID period. I uh, am unable to think any other time better than today's con context for a workshop of this nature. Say, for an uh, instance, we all are busy clinicians and we all are interested on what should be done for, I mean, to do the correct thing for our patients. So I'm also in many groups uh, uh, for, I mean, professionals. And uh, uh, this, despite so much of an effort to disseminate evidence-based medicine, there is uh, so much of interest among clinicians. I say that to give many things uh, for uh, patients as nothing is available to give. Uh, so I don't think that as a good practice, uh, if there is nothing to be given, we have to accept uh, there's nothing to be given and we should be able to communicate that to patients. So the, uh, uh, I mean, 
uh, as such, and uh, as there are many other reasons, uh, I think that we need to have uh, more and more of this type of workshops to update doctors. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, I welcome this workshop very much, and I'm thankful to all resource persons uh, uh, for uh, uh, accepting to spend their, uh, uh, to, to uh, accepting to uh, disseminate knowledge and to share their expertise with the participants and also for deciding uh, on spending their valuable time on this venture. Uh, I'm also thankful to Dr. Shahan Silva for uh, liaising uh, and organizing this workshop as well as my two uh, colleagues from our council, Professor Sudarshani Vasala Tantri, and also Dr. Chaturu Suravira. So before I uh, wind up, let me uh, remind all participants that the uh, membership of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association is your professional organization, and it's uh, a very prestigious association, and it's a must that you need to be a member, and membership now is available online and also I invite you to get yourself registered for the annual academic conference and uh, I, uh, 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 I uh, uh, wish all the best for this, uh, uh, the, this workshop that would be conducted over next uh, four hours. So the, uh, for me to introduce our first speaker, our first speaker is uh, Professor Kumara Mendes, Carter Professor of Family Medicine, University of Kalania. Uh, over to Professor Mendes. Thank you very much. Professor Mendes. Yes, madam. We'll, we are we'll, yeah, just going. Okay, thank you very much, madam, for the introduction and giving us the opportunity to present the EBM workshop. And good morning to all of you and welcome to the pre-congress pre session of the 134th SLMA Anniversary International Medical Congress. In fact, this is the second SLMA EBM workshop. Uh, we first did this in 2019 and we are very thankful for you and the team uh, for this opportunity to continue this. I will just uh, take a minute to give you the format, general format. We will be doing under each topic, uh, presentations, 30 to 45 minutes in duration. And we'll try to make these presentations a bit more interactive and include uh, some hands-on work and quizzes. Throughout the session, the chat will be on so that you can post your questions to the team. Please raise the hand option at any given question time if you want to ask a question. It is almost three decades since 1992 uh, when the new paradigm of teaching and practice clinical medicine was introduced. It was in 1992 that Sackett and the group introduced the first paper, tradition, anecdote, and theoretical reasoning from basic sciences would be replaced by evidence from high quality randomized control trials and observational studies even in combination with the clinical expertise and the needs and wishes of patients. EBM made, a, made clinical practice more scientific and empirically grounded and thereby achieving safer, more consistent and more cost-effective care. In the 30 minutes, next 30 to 35 minutes, we, I will be discussing four under four topics, why the evidence-based medicine movement was born, Second, why is evidence medicine what what is evidence based medicine and what is not evidence based medicine? Third, evolving evidence based practice and issues. And lastly, why do we need evidence based medicine than ever before? As uh, Madam President just 
on her remark also stated this is the time that we need this more than ever before now this is a picture from india this is a current picture as it is a monk was passing through a village uh, i think it's called kesaputra and he is greeted by his inhabitants the kalamas and then they ask for his advice they say that many wandering holy men and ascetic pass through expounding their teachings and criticizing the teachings of others so whose teaching should they follow he delivers the response uh in a sermon that serves as an entry in point into one of the evidence base uh, ev uh, in uh, for the uh, the buddhist philosophy and this is almost uh, very important to me because this is the first lecture in 1975 that i was given when we entered the faculty of medicine colombo and our teacher was uh, our dear Professor Carlo Fonseca. So this is the first uh, story he started the lecture with. So what this uh, and the monk who was passing through and gave the seminar, this uh, sermon was Lord Buddha. So very briefly, you will know all of this. He told ten things, but the thing that we should all remember is do not believe because he is a teacher when he said kalamas when you are yourselves know these things are good these things are not blamable these things are praised by the wise undertaken and observed these things lead to benefit and happiness enter into and abide in them so we are at the very crucial moment in our history of practice of medicine that this is important so we start why evidence based medicine this is a cartoon i like in four pictures this is not in sri lanka this is i mean standard practice in sri lanka if you go to five doctors most likely you will get five things but this is this was published in early 2000 2000 why the evidence based medicine movement was born to explain why so if you go and tell a doctor in the us this was published in the us i have flu one will say take rest the next will say you should also i think take some antibiotics then the third person will tell you need i think antivirals i think it's flu you should take this prescription and give some drugs so this was a thing why evidence based medicine was born there were different practices even for the same illness so 1970s saw wide variation in practice patterns when a different physicians when different physicians are recommending different things for the essentially the same patients it is impossible to claim that they are doing the right thing large pro proportions of procedures being performed by physicians were considered inappropriate even by the standard of their own experts many practices taken for granted by physicians were actually found to be ineffective when subjected to clinical trials and cochrane pointed this out in no uncertain terms the gap between clinical research and what was actually happening in clinical practice was getting larger and larger even when randomized control trials were done uh, just to remind you randomized control trials were started long before 1992 it could take years for physicians to actually change their practice to incorporate new information the classic example is aspirin in acute myocardial infarction the first clinical trials were done successfully in 1985 it got into guidelines and implementation stage after 15 years in 
why EBM was born. You will all recognize this picture of thalidomide babies trying to get into a pool. What about evidence? Dr. Karen Kelsey was a Canadian American working at that time at the FDA. You know, everybody's talking about the FDA. And we always uh, look upon FDA, CDC, WHO to see whether they have approved this drug. She had the guts to say that she will not approve this drug because she wanted more information about this drug. Whereas at the same time, the Canadian Licensing Authority gave the green light. What happened? The Canadians ended up with at least 125 babies with deformities that you saw. And the US narrowly missed it because one doctor's, at least one doctor, Dr. Kelsey, stood up to the pressure of pharmaceuticals and said, no, we are well aware of the two exemplary stands taken by our two MOHs in two cities regarding vaccination. I hope that we had at least one or two dozens of people like that. I think the vaccination program would be much more uh, successful today. So, why was evidence-based medicine born? Long before 1992, there were papers telling us that for common, very common serious diseases like acute myocardial infarction, the view of physicians at that time and the randomized control trial, what it said was two different things. And the review article, this is a classic review article, a comparison of results of meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and recommendations from clinical experts. In the next few speakers, you will understand exactly what a meta-analysis, RCT, and what the so-called expert review, which is we all are very fond of experts reviews, right? So experts, do their best, but they have a lot of biases taken, taken in. So during this uh, paper, it was clearly before second and them, they showed that there are dangerous differences between expert opinion and opinion from randomized control trials, even for a disease like myocardial infarction. And this is also, I think most of the physicians are uh, aware of this landmark study about Plecanamide for cardiac arrhythmias. Same thing happened. So, what is evidence based medicine? So, this is the classic paper, the first paper introducing EBM by Sacker's group, which is quoted by most clinicians and academics when they define EBM. This causes a lot of issues as EBM changed during even the next five years. We are nearly three decades on from 1992, but even during the first five years, it changed. And this is a typical of a very critical editorial that appeared in the Lancet. So it was not all positive from the beginning. No, there were many, many. So this says that, right, you have produced a so-called new paradigm but don't try to be too smart, that kind of editorial. And as you know, Abraham Vagasi is a, one of my favorite people, uh, professor of medicine, Stanford, who brought in bedside medicine with the Stanford 25. And he was not also a very, uh, he questioned, EBM is like safe sex, talked a lot, preached a little, and practiced infrequently. And he questioned, before EBM, what were we doing? So can you see, it was not all smooth 
sailing for EBM. Then this is the landmark paper that I believe if you read one paper, you read this very brief editorial. And this is the key article that clarified and answered the critics what is meant by evidence based medicine. It was by the second, it was uh, second. Uh, reply to all the critics after about four years of his initial paper. And he defined what clinical expertise is because most of the 19, most of the paper, 1992 paper did not uh, very specifically uh, dealt with this. So clinical expertise in the BMJ article, he said, means the proficiency and judgment that individual clinicians acquire through clinical experience and clinical practice. Increased expertise is reflected in many ways, but especially in more effective and more efficient diagnosis and in the more thoughtful identification and compassionate use of individual patients' predicament, rights and preferences in making clinical decisions about their care. Now, Upfront, we say this workshop we do not, we cannot teach, and we not, do not intend to teach clinical expertise. It comes with practice, it comes with years uh, of practicing as a clinician, is a one leg of the three leg tool, uh, stool that we need to practice EBM. So, without clinical expertise, you cannot practice EBM. So, this is another false notion that some people have. So what is best available evidence? Clinical, clinically relevant research, often from the basic sciences of medicine, is still included. Especially from patient-centered clinical research into the accuracy and precision of diagnostic testing, not only about treatment, diagnostic testing, and clinical examination it is vital. Some of the clinical science that we were taught as students 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it's completely obsolete, right? So we have to admit that the power of prognostic ma uh, markers, the efficiency, efficacy, and safety of therapeutic, rehabilitative, and preemptive relief. So external clinical evidence both invalidates previously accepted diagnostic tests and treatments and replace them with new ones that are much more powerful and more accurate, more efficacious and safe. I think uh, Dr. Shehan will specifically define the three words, efficacy, efficiency, effectiveness. These are three words that you should know the differences. Evidence-based medicine is not just cookbook medicine. If you are given a most powerful computer with all the guidelines and uh, point of care resources, you will not be able to practice evidence-based medicine. External clinical evidence can inform but never replace individual clinical expertise. It is also a notion that even recent articles in leading medical journals seem still they are on 1992 paper, right? So it is an integrated decision, getting the clinic, clinician's expertise with the best possible evidence and not forgetting what the patient wants, patient's individual needs and the context. Another huge myth, EBM is restricted to only randomized control trials and meta-analysis. This is not true at all. With the next slide, I will show you why it is not. This is a little bit old, 2005. The BMJ group tried to work out the proportion of, they took the proportion uh, of common the common treatments that we use for common diseases and they try to find out how much of evidence that they have. You can see this graph hopefully. 
beneficial levinas likely beneficial least likely so that means going from about systematic reviews and randomized control trials observational trial any case studies all put together there was nearly only 50% 51% was still clinicians expertise but they had previously known so this is 2005 even now it may have improved the 51% may have reduced to maybe 45% but still we have only about half of any treatment covered by at least a case report so the notion that we all depend on randomized control trials i wish we could but it is not the truth now this is the two within about 10 years the definition of the 1992 paper change from this to the integration of best research evidence with the clinical expertise and patient values so in the diagram this is a commonly shown diagram people know this then i'm going to play a small video not even two and a half minutes and that's one of the best examples best definitions of ebm given by david sackett himself to a tv presenter okay hopefully you can hear this is that you're being acknowledged for your work on evidence based medicine yes. what's what is that term that is a natural outgrowth of clinical epidemiology that has three elements the first and most important is the patient uh, what is their problem how do they see their problem what are their expectations what do they want to get out of the transaction the second is your own clinical skills you got to be a good doctor you have to be very good at diagnostics uh, and sorting out exactly what's going on and then the third would be the evidence that you draw upon to make decisions about that patient's therapy and putting all those three together is what we call evidence based so again you you heard sackett did not mention the best evidence first what he mentioned first was what the patient wants what the patient needs second your own clinical expertise is important third only you make you have the best evidence to formulate a diagnosis and the treatment so remember we need three things of evidence based medicine and mostly this session is about accessing and how to acquire access and present and uh, appraise clinical uh, the best evidence evolving evidence based medicine and some issues despite its ancient origin evidence based medicine remains actively a relatively young discipline not only about three decades whose positive impacts are just beginning to be validated and will be continue continuously evolving one of the key questions that physicians ask can some people a little bit uh, hesitant to practice evidence based medicine is they think they need expertise to search and critically appraise articles at the point of care and the people shy away and say how how can i do this i mean i have not searched for ages and how how do i critically appraise a paper we are clinicians we don't have time so these are the the issues and this was answered by none other than gordon gaet so this bmj uh, editorial was written in 2002 practitioners of evidence based medicine uh, evidence based care not all clinicians need to appraise evidence from scratch but all need some skills so that skills will be given by prof shamila she has a, a very good very uh, the section that she has uh, agreed to present 
is one of the most important things. But in this presentation, in this uh, video, I will show you what exactly the uh, conversation between Richard Smith and Gordon Guyatt about critical appraisal. Space medicine, and you've kind of changed the way you teach it? Uh, we haven't changed the way we've te we teach it, but our targets have changed. So when I took over the internal medicine residency program in 1990, uh, I had it in my head that we were at the end of residency training uh, with us. Uh, individuals would be able to pick up a randomized trial, critically appraise it, um, decide, assess it, understand the results very well, and they'd be able to do that for studies of prognosis or diagnosis or systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And at the end of seven years of residency training, I had learned that very few of my graduates were actually able to do that. Um, and so the target became different. The target became to have people appreciate the principles of what makes trustworthy evidence and not trustworthy evidence and be able to go to secondary sources of information that produced trust, uh, summaries of evidence that were trustworthy and identified the confidence that one could put into those. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, published in, I believe, 2002, a paper in the BMJ in which we identified that everybody doesn't have to, every clinician who is practicing evidence-based medicine doesn't have to be an evidence-based expert. They need to understand the principles and they need to be identified the appropriate resources that, prevent, that present processed evidence to them in a way that they can apply it to clinical care, understanding the underlying confidence in the evidence. And some of my colleagues, um, as we were talking about this on email beforehand, uh, referred to this as evidence-based capitulation. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, it, okay. it is so a realistic way. So what every clinician should know are basics of study design, how we appraise different clinical entities. This will be they will be in detail. At least this much, I think, should be known. And about pre appraise evidence, where could you find it? Where could you, can you find it free? What kind of payments would you want to make if you want to really get at the pre appraise evidence? We will all discuss this. And critical appraisal has again come to the forefront. Why? Because of COVID. Lots of non-peer-reviewed articles are being put on servers and you will hear from our colleagues about this when searching, when appraising. Okay. And this is the another paper if you want to read. I told you that's one paper. This is the 25-year-old, 25-year uh, anniversary what they put together, an oral history of evidence-based medicine. There are also uh, a few videos. And as I told, there are issues. We don't deny it. This is a classic paper that came out from the people who practice, promote, and teach evidence-based medicine about the movement in crisis and what has to be done. And it is the book by Ben Golke. I hope that you have at least heard this name. If you want to get at pharmaceutical companies, what they do, you have to. You can read this book, downloadable free from the internet. So in the next few minutes, why do we need evidence-based medicine? Why at this point? Just think what we have been doing in the last few decades. We ourselves recommended lobectomy as a cure for schizophrenia. It isn't. We said triglycerides don't matter. They do. We once told a few decades ago, peptic ulcers can't be infectious. Many are caused by H. pylori. And even the etiology of disease, asthma is a disease of the smooth muscles. I still remember when we were young, that was quite long time ago, when the salbutamol inhalers came, 
it was magic we, we, because we were using amenophilin oral tablets ephedrine co it was told asthma is a disease of the smooth muscle now it is not it is a inflammatory origin first and foremost and very recently until about 5 years ago maybe still some of us may be giving oxygen to each and every patient that is having an acute uncomplicated myocardial infarction oxygen cannot harm yes it can and very lately i hope there are some surgeons at least on this forum acute appendicitis appendicitis need surgery appendectomy maybe not especially in children it's almost the rule now so we need evidence based medicine to keep up to date with these things and not to make mistakes but we can because we all do science is that we recognize a mistake and just make we admit it and then we take some measures to uh, uh, rectify this mistake it is not like ayurveda we can't tell because we have been doing this for 25 years in the ward we will be still doing it no that is not possible so the other why do we need exponent i just this morning as of today there are 32 million citations in pubmed only and you may know pubmed is just one of the one of the uh, databases uh, medical databases web of science has at least five fold of pubmed but you need to pay dollars to access it money in pubmed only 32 million there are 166000 systematic reviews but only 15000 cochrane systematic reviews this is a, and i just searched about covid 167000 citations 593 randomized control trials and 18000 review articles so how do we all can we can we comprehend this ourselves impossible humanly right why do we need evidence based medicine this is one of the most important things that we are doing this session there was a at least only one of this type of uh, surveys done by uh, professor abesen and the group and it was done in about 300 doctors from five general hospitals this was done in 2007 to 10 a, a, a era Uh, specialists were there pg trainees uh, general medical officers were 70% uh, with experience of 6 now this is the important thing 87% had heard the term evidence based medicine only 30% were aware of cochrane library and 47% claimed to understand the terms systematic reviews and meta analysis and the conclusion were attitude towards ebm was relatively good even though knowledge practices of ebm was poor they recommended strengthening ebm training among undergraduates provision uh, of in service training and facilities to engage in ebm for practicing doctors and change in the culture so these were recommendations i i think we are we need another survey soon to it is because the pgim training programs are almost all have some components of evidence based medicine whereas our undergraduate curriculum sadly still do not have they stop at clinical epidemiology now coming back into the 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 kalama uh, story this was one of the key papers published by professor carl von seeka this was submitted this happened when i joined the university in 1996 i think 5 6 he submitted this into to the sri uh, silon medical journal was rejected completely then he submitted to the bmj they published in the prestigious christmas issue and he came out with 10 things uh 10 i think uh, uh problems that he faced and the uh, errors that he made i want you to share and he starts with the kalama 
I have just, uh, I took the liberty to modify certain words. So now we look Kalama. This is what Buddha told Kalama. Now look Kalama. So I will say, now look doctors. Do not let by reports by CNN or BBC or traditions, but you have been doing for a long time in the wards or yeah, say what you see in the Facebook. Be not led by authority of religious texts, guidelines issued by the colleges and ministry, nor by logic and inference, physiology principles alone. And the last, nor by idea that this is our teacher. So replace it with this is our professor or college president. So if you replace these words, you will at least have uh, your focus on doing what is best according to your own knowledge. This is what, if Kalamas 2,500 years ago could do this, I think the medical, uh, uh, as medical doctors with a basic degree, at least of MBBS, double degrees, we should be able to take our own decision. And this is the last slide. This is a picture of World War II Nazi prisoner of war camp in Poland. Almost freezing temperatures, not to eight degrees. Severe epidemics of typhus, typhoid, typhus, diphtheria, they were jaundice, uh, that in hepatitis, sand fly fever, more than 300 cases of pitting edema above the knee. This was the group of prisoners and they were fed just enough to keep them alive. 600 calorie diet. Remember, 1944, there were no antibiotics. The doctor in charge of this 20,000 prison camp was himself, uh, P, uh, the, the POW uh, medical person was a doctor in charge of this prison camp. And I want to pose a question after six months, how many prisoners died? Freezing temperature, 600 kilocalorie diet, no antibiotics. They had a little bit of aspirin for pain. What kind of numbers would have died? I can't see the, the chat. If you can put even to the chat, that's about one minute more, right? I'm not sure what you are getting, uh, the guesses are. Are they putting anything on the? So I'll give you only four deaths and three were from gunshot wounds by the guards. So this demonstrates the, the power of the human body. And I think uh, as Madam Dr. Uh, Padma Gunaratta told, the mere fact that we don't have anything to give does not justify us giving a drug. This is the best example that I could think of. Only one person died of a disease, others were shot. And do you know who this doctor of the prison camp was? This is the photograph of this doctor of the prison camp with his identity card. This was Archie Cochrane. He was in charge of this camp. So, in summary, why the evidence-based medicine movement was born, we looked at it. And what is evidence-based medicine? Consists of three things, patients' values, clinician, clinicians' expertise, and the best possible evidence that we can get. Evolving evidence-based practice and some issues. Yes, there are some issues. And we can deal with this. It is an evolving process. And why do we need evidence-based medicine ever than before in one word because of COVID? Thank you. Uh, I think you can post the, the questions into the chat if you have. So I now invite uh, Dr. Mary Lou Dharmakan to give the second part of this workshop. Over to you, Mary Lou.
Um, so I think Sir gave us a very objectives. So good morning. I think um, Sir gave us a very uh, concise and informative discussion about why we need evidence-based medicine, what it is. So I'm going to pick up from where he left off, and these are going to be my objectives. They are evidence-based medicine and its components. Recognize the five A's of the evidence-based medicine approach. Identify the hierarchy of the evidence, that's the five S pyramid, and form a clinical question in the PICO format. Evidence-based medicine determines if clinical decisions are supported by scientific data instead of pure tradition and medicinal art form. There is good evidence that the quality of care we give our patients could be better if we use good evidence. Most of the time, people think evidence-based medicine is landmark clinical trials. When it was started, it was always used in medicine in the form of according to the trial, this is what is the best treatment. Then it evolved and instead of applying evidence directly to the patient, it used integrating the best available evidence with the clinical experience and expertise of the doctor and the patient values to bring on the best management plan. Okay, okay. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. Objectives. Explain. Um, so, yeah, we were talking about uh, the objectives, that is, explain EBM and its components, recognize the five ways of the EBM approach, identify the hierarchy of the evidence, that is the 5S pyramid, and form a clinical question. Um, so, I told you that uh, most of the time people think that evidence based medicine is landmark clinical trials. When it was started, it was always used in medicine in the form of, according to this trial, this is the best treatment. Then, as Sir said, it evolved. And instead of applying the evidence directly to the patient, they started integrating the evidence with the best um, available evidence with the clinical experience and the expertise of the doctor. And the patient values were taken foremost. If we talk about evidence, it is finding from patient-centered clinical research uh, that is relevant to the patient care. It doesn't always have to be RCTs and meta-analysis. So we see a good example of this during the COVID vaccine. They used it on chimpanzees, which were lab studies. So external clinical evidence can inform us, but it can't replace the individual clinical experience. And this is, the, this is important because this decides whether the external evidence can be applied to our patients at all, and if so, how it should be integrated into the clinical decision. So if we take the steps of evidence-based medicine. These are the steps of evidence-based medicine. You need to ask a clinical question. You need to acquire the best evidence. You need to appraise that evidence. You need to then apply that evidence and assess your patient. So we all have queries that we need answers to when we are treating our patients. It might be with regard to diagnosis, treatment in the form of which drug is better, or new investigations and if it is useful. Every patient gives us an opportunity of learning. There are usually an information overload and a limited time. This is the point at which our knowledge in evidence-based medicine becomes important as we can find the best available evidence for our query. So we should follow these steps. First of all, we need to ask a question which is precise about information you need to solve a patient's dilemma. So these questions can be, these questions can be either background questions or they can be foreground questions. So if we take the background questions, there are usually a gap in our clinical knowledge uh, which is about a diagnosis or a treatment or um, an investigation. So as we become more experienced, our background knowledge gaps get filled and we have more foreground questions than background questions. So the foreground questions are actually higher order, very specific questions that are specific for that patient sitting in front of us. So if we take a background question, it can be what causes heart failure and what is the treatment? Whereas our foreground question will be 
um, in this patient on maximally treated medical management who has heart failure, will an ICD improve mortality? Then we have to acquire the um, evidence and that is a very important skill. Supun will be doing that in the next uh, presentation and we have to locate the best evidence. There are many clinical resources and databases that we can acquire evidence from. And we must familiarize ourselves with this so that we can use them. And evidence has a hierarchy. I will be talking about that hierarchy and we must base our decisions on the highest credibility of evidence. And once we get the evidence, we have to appraise it and we have to determine whether it's trustworthy. This means you have to analyze the data in articles, see if the studies are done well and if the results are valid, significant and reliable, as well as if, if it can be applied to our patient. Then we apply it to our patient and assess how it worked. So I told you now, when we uh, look at the background questions, it could be mostly who, what, where, and how. But our foreground questions will have a very specific format. And that is this PICO format. So this is the first step in evidence-based medicine. And it is a helpful tool to uh, develop a clearly focused question. So it uh, helps us to dissect the clinical question into components and structure it properly so that once we put it into a search engine, it's very easy and we would get a precise answer. So if you take the components of PICO, P would be population. That is a relevant group of patients studied for a particular health problem. If your population is specific, your data will be more specific. It is usually how you describe your patient. Then if we take I, that stands for intervention. It is the treatment, diagnosis, exposure, or prognostic factor considered for the patient with the health problem under investigation. The comparator is the population with the same specific health issue as the patient, but they don't undergo the specific treatment or investigation. And the outcome is usually based on your efficacy and safety. You have to have a measure measurable result um, to see if your intervention is applied successfully. And patient relevant consequences can be things like morbidity, mortality, quality of life, pain, and others. Now the PICO, if you want to make it more specific, it has two other parts, T, it will be two Ts. One T would be the type of question. That is if it's a question on therapy, prognosis, or risk. And the other T will be the types of studies. So I will be talking to you about the type of studies now, but we'll quickly go through uh, example of the PICO. Um, I would like you all, if you can, to um, go to Go Soap Box and uh, Supun will share the code that you all can put in to enter because uh, we'll be going through a few examples that you all can also try in future. So this is we are living in the COVID era and we've been using encolic hand wash and washing our hands so many times. And sometimes we must be thinking which is better. So for a question like this also, we can use the PICO to find the best evidence. So for health personnel entering a healthcare facility is hand rubbing with waterless alcohol-based solution as effective as standard hand washing with antiseptic soap for reducing contamination. So here, the population would be the health personnel entering the healthcare facility. The intervention would be alcoholic hand rub. The comparison would be standard hand washing and the outcome would be the risk of contamination. So if we structure our question, it comes for healthcare personnel entering a healthcare facility, would alcoholic hand rub be more effective than standard hand washing at reducing the risk of contamination. So now we are going to the levels of evidence. There are different types of evidence and not all information is equal. So we need to identify the highest level of evidence and studies that are conducted with very sound methodology to support our decisions. 
So the resources near the top of the pyramid are pre-appraised. That is, they are already being critically appraised by somebody. So if we take all these uh, epidemiological study designs, we can organize them at different levels. If we start at the bottom, it's animal and laboratory studies, and these are the lowest level of evidence. And if we proceed, we see expert opinion. So an expert opinion can be given by somebody who has uh, an opinion. Say a, phys a physician tells you that there are two drugs and he sees that one drug is better than the other one. But it is only evidence that can tell us that drug A gives us a 40% benefit or drug B gives us a 60% benefit. So expert opinions are always based on a little bit of bias. So if we take case reports and case series, there are detailed reports on individual patients. They can be unique cases which are described, but they are small studies. So they are more difficult to generalize about. The next level of evidence is case control and cohort studies, which are observational studies. These have a better level of evidence, but here the investigator uh, plays a passive role and he looks back at it either retrospectively or prospectively. Randomized control trials are actually a high level of evidence and it actually assesses a variable in the form of a treatment or procedure. A patient is either assigned a treatment or not and everybody is similar at the baseline. So it has more rigorous methodology to eliminate bias and allows for a comparison between an intervention group and controls. But the quality of a randomized control trial can, uh, has to be determined by us. We have to review it and assess it for the quality. So if we take systematic reviews after that, it focuses on a clinical topic and as answers a specific question. Like for an example, the effect of an intervention or treatment. We can take an example of paracetamol. Is it safe and effective at elevating back pain? So they systematically appraise all the individual trials testing this question. So avoid random error and bias. They are pre-appraised. And they go through a very predetermined protocol. They can be used to find whether scientific findings are reliable and generalizable, but these are not primary sources. They're actually compilations of research from primary sources. So do you know what is the best uh, systematic, where you can get your best systematic review um, from? The Cochrane Library is actually the most famous protocol used. It's very hard to make systematic reviews, and that is considered the gold standard. So if we take meta-analysis, it's like a systematic review, but it uses a quantitative method and it summarizes the results and give us, gives us an average. So it is conducted in the same manner as the systematic review, but it gives a better overview of the clinical significance of the relationship studied. So the difference between a systematic review and a meta-analysis is that in systematic review, they combine previously published articles that use different outcome measures. Whereas in a systematic meta-analysis, they combine statistically the results of a group of previously published articles that use the same outcome measures. So right at the top of our pyramid, we have guidelines. And these are developed by a group of experts. It is, a, it is actually an evidence-based recommendation based on systematically search and appraised research literature. So this is actually what um, the standard levels of evidence, but have you all heard of network meta-analysis? Now, all this time when they do research, they have done it comparing a drug to a placebo or comparing two different drugs. So what if we want to compare the effective of effectiveness of more than two drugs? That's when we need a network meta-analysis. And uh, it compares three or more interventions simultaneously, and they do it by using direct and indirect evidence. So the, you can mm, get a number of treatment, a hierarchy of treatments can be compared. 
the importance of network, like what has to be important in a network meta-analysis is that the different sets of studies included in the analysis are similar on average in all important factors. Like we take a baseline similarity in randomized controlled trials. In this, the sets of studies have to be similar at the baseline and that is called transitivity. So this is how you do a network meta-analysis. Say there's a drug A and it's compared to B. So drug A is better than drug B. Then you take drug B and compare it to C and say drug B is better than drug C. So indirectly, A can be better than C. So this is a meta-analysis that they have done on SSRIs. The width of the line is proportional to the number of studies carried out. And the size of the circle is reflective of the participants in the trial. So here they show us that egomelatinine, amitriptyline, escitalopram, and mirtazapine were related, were rated as the most effective. Whereas agomelatinine, citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetine, and sertaline were more acceptable by the people. Then there is a new study, not actually new, but it's very important to us during this time. It's called a test negative design. Now this test negative design is something that we use to um, check the if efficacy of a vaccine. So its validity is predicted on the core assumption that the intervention that is giving the vaccine has no effect on other non-targeted etiologies resulting in a similar illness. So it's a type of case control study. The vaccine status is compared between test positive cases versus test negative controls who present to a clinician. Uh, generally with some standardized definition of the illness. So here, if there are people who visit a medical institution due to a influenza-like in illness, if they, pos I mean, if they test positive, then they are called cases. If they test negative, they are called controls. And then they are checked to see if they are given the vaccine or not. And by this, we can check the vaccine effect efficacy. This is done for influenza vaccine, and now it is very important because they do it to study the efficacy of the COVID vaccine. So um, now I told you about guidelines, and in guidelines, it's very important to us, for us to know the levels of evidence. So if we look at a guideline and it tells us that it's a level one evidence, that means that it's a systematic review of a randomized controlled trial. If it is 1B, it's an individual randomized control trial. 1C, an all or none randomized control trial. Then if we come a little bit down on the pyramid, a level 2A recommendation would be a systematic review of a cohort study. Level 2B will be an individual cohort study. Level 2C will be outcomes research. Then if we take level 3A, that will be a systematic review of a case control study. 3B will be individual case control studies. Level 4 comes below, that's case series. And level 5, expert opinion without explicit critical appraisal or based on bench research. As I told you before, to make your PICO question more specific, you can use the two T's and one of them will be uh, what type of study it is. That is, if it's an intervention study, what should I do about this condition or problem? If it's an etiological study, what causes the problem? If it's a diagnosis study, does this person have this condition? Who will get this condition or problem will be prognosis. How common is the problem would be a frequency study. And what is the types of problem will be a phenomenon study. And then depending on the question, it can be different study types. Now we know that a randomized control trial is the only way to answer a therapy question. But if we take a prognosis question, a cohort study will be more, uh, give you more evidence than a case control, which would give you more evidence than a case series. In the same way, if you take a preventive prevention study, a randomized control trial would be 
give, would give you more evidence that a cohort study, more than a case, series, case control, more than a case series. Um, I would like to go through some clinical scenarios with you and see if you could make some PICO questions based on that. So if you all have um, the soap box, you all can put your answers in that. So there are lots of times when there are older patients who come to us who ask us whether they should be taking calcium and vitamin D. And we should be, we should know, like we should have good evidence to see if it actually helps prevent osteoporosis or if it's doing more harm than good. So Mrs. P is a 78 year old patient who is treated for mild hypertension, but is otherwise healthy with no chronic disease. She has very little sensation on her lower legs and walks with a cane. She lives alone and is concerned about falling. Her son has just read an article about vitamin D and calcium. And because the article said it could prevent accidental falls, she asks you if vitamin D and calcium really help prevent falls. So what does the evidence say? So to find out what is what the evidence says, we have to first format a PICO question. So if you all could actually put your questions um, in the so go soap box. So your population would be older women. Your intervention would be vitamin D and calcium. Your comparative will be none. And your outcome would be what you're checking for the redu reduction in falls or prevention of injury from falls. So your question would be, um, does vitamin D and calcium reduce or prevent injury from falls in older women? So um, when we were medical students, there was a lot of uh, talk about eggs and how many eggs we should eat in a day to be healthy. So 55 year old male patient with a history of ischemic heart disease and hypertension, he has, least, he has recently started on a vegetarian diet and is consuming an egg daily in order to maintain his protein requirement. His wife is very concerned that this might increase his cholesterol level and thereby increase his chance of having another stroke or heart attack. What will be your response? So what does the evidence say? If anybody can put it in the go soap box, that would be better before we discuss it. So if we go through the answers, it would be the population would be a 55 year old male patient diagnosed with ischemic heart disease and hypertension. The more specific you are, the more specific your results are going to be. And it lessens the number of studies, so it's easier for you to get the best results. Then the intervention would be egg consumption daily, the comparator would be none, and the outcome would be increased risk of stroke or ischemic heart disease. So in um, the question would be structured as, in 55-year-old male patients diagnosed with ischemic heart disease and hypertension, does daily egg consumption increase the risk of stroke or ischemic heart disease? That is what you need to put into your search engine. Um, now, regarding COVID, we've been having a lot of information, a lot of overload of information actually about what are the treatments that work. So there is this study that they have done called the principal study in England, where they take uh, COVID patients who are older and who have comorbidities in the community and they have given them buddhasonide. And they have seen that that causes a significantly reduced chance of requiring urgent care and hospitalization. Uh, it demonstrates a faster resolution of fever, provides faster symptom re resolution and reduces the chances of persistent COVID-19 symptoms at 14 and 28 days. So if you read this study, would you want to prescribe this to your patient or would you want to find out more about it? So we would need more evidence and we would want to put it into a PICO question format. So you all can do that also in your soap box. So if we take that, 
uh, our patient population would be more than 55 year old patients who have COVID-19 and comorbidities. The intervention would be the budesonoid inhaler, the comparator none and reduce time to recovery or hospital admission and that would be the outcome we're looking for. So the question would uh, be structured as in um, patients older than 55 years who have COVID-19 and comorbidities, does the budesonoid inhaler reduce time to recovery of hospital admissions and deaths? That would be your question that you need to put in your search engine. So now I told you all how you all form the question and then we have to acquire the evidence. Supun would be teaching you all hands on how to acquire this evidence and we usually use secondary resources like PubMed, Google, Scholar and Cochrane Library. So how do we know the levels of this evidence? That is very important because we have to uh, get the best available evidence. So if we take this uh, Haynes 5S model, it's actually a framework to structure a search of for evidence. And it's like a map. It shows us where to go next. So this was developed by Brian Haynes of the McMaster University, and it helps provide directed support to search evidence-based resources. Now, if we look at this, we see that uh, the most numerous and easily accessible are right at the bottom. And as we go up the pyramid, the number of uh, resources lesser, as does the fee, but the ones at the bottom are original research. They have not been appraised before. So we have to appraise them for validity, reliability, whereas above they are all pre-appraised. So if we take the bottomest rung of this, it's single studies. These are original journal, journal articles that present the entire report of one study on one aspect of a management of a health problem. So these can be, we can use any type of study design here, case series, case reports, expert opinions, randomized controlled trials. But the important thing is that it has to be critically appraised ourselves. Then if we go to synthesis, they take the information from single studies and combine them systematically into one document. So I spoke to you about uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So they gather data from previously published research and combine them, and they make huge data sets. So we have fewer documents to go through. Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews contains many systematic reviews like this. So the, since the evidence is more applicable to the whole population, this is more generalizable. Then if we go up the pyramid, uh, synopsis are actually structured studies like systematic reviews. So they concisely present all the findings of synthesis and allow us to quickly assess only what is relevant to us. So they can be in the form of secondary journals or the ACP journal club. The problem with this or the drawback with this is they only give us a specific aspect of a disease or one aspect of a disease like a diagnosis or treatment, something like that. Then if we come uh, higher, those are summaries, and these are uh, best practice guidelines and evidence-based textbooks. So they combine the results of synopsis with expert opinions on the topic and create recommendations. It is regularly updated and the recommendations are clearly given. So to make it easier to access high quality evidence, but it comes at a cost. This is the first place where we should look for evidence. So in this, we have point of care resources like Dynamed, UpToDate and BMJ best practice. They will be discussed later. So they, are, they were a game changer in evidence-based medicine and they gave us a fast food type approach to accessing evidence-based medicine. It makes it so much easier for busy clinicians to keep abreast with the latest developments. Then finally, we're coming to the systems and these are clinical decision support systems. They take research evidence and integrate it with individual patient data to create evidence-based, customized, specific design plans. So most of our hospitals have electronic medical records, but we don't have guidelines integrated into them so that 
it will help us with particular patient care. If we put in a particular patient, it should give us the recommendations that we need to do with the treatment or investigation of that particular patient. So if we look at this, we see that sources at the bottom of the pyramid, you need to spend more time to search and appraise the evidence. As you move up, the cost of the resources increases, quality of the resource increases, time taken to produce the resource increases, while the number of resources decrease. So if we just take a summary, like I told you, studies begin with original primary databases at the foundation. You get millions of studies. Then if you take synthesis, there are systematic reviews such as the Cochrane review at the next level. You get hundreds and thousands of those. If you take synopsis, there are very brief descriptions of original articles and reviews but it only gives us one aspect of the disease. You get tens of thousands of that. Summaries integrate best available evidence from the lower layers to provide a full range of evidence concerning management options for a given health problem. You get thousands of those and systems are right on the top. So if we look at this again, um, systems you get only less than 100. Summaries you get around 50,000. It takes a few months to a few years to update it. They're quite expensive. The evidence level is moderate to high and it addresses a whole disease. Whereas synopsis contains a few hundred thousand, it takes a few weeks to few months to update. The cost is moderate, evidence moderate to high, and it only gives you one aspect of the disease, like a diagnosis, treatment, or etiology. The synthesis, you get less than 100,000. It takes a few months to years to update. It's actually free. The evidence level is high, but it gives you a very specific issue addressed. Whereas studies would be millions. It takes very little time to update. It's actually free. And it can be, evidence level can be different. And the completeness of access also will be different. So, Traditionally, evidence-based medicine was all the steps I described. You formulate an answerable question, search the literature, appraise the articles, and apply it to your patient. But like I told you, new school ev evidence-based medicine has changed a bit. If you know to formulate your answerable question, and if you can afford to get a point of care resource, or you know where to look for pre-appraised evidence, you can directly apply it to your patient. Having said that, I have to tell you that now we have a lot of articles and um, things telling us which are not pre-appraised. So we need to actually look at the paper and analyze it, at least basically analyze it to find out if it is valid. So in summary, the top global challenges is to provide evidence based cost-effective quality care that will improve practice and improve patient outcomes. There are wide variations in practice patterns. The research practice gap and the emergence of clinical trials made the new paradigm of evidence-based med medicine. Evidence-based medicine is the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. There is evidence for only about 60% of commonly used treatment. Only 55% of patients get treatment based on evidence-based guidelines. Expert knowledge of critical appraisal may not be needed to practice evidence-based medicine, but basic understanding of the appraisal is crucial as a clinician. How to practice evidence-based medicine is changing. You formulate answerable question, search for pre-appraised evidence, and apply it to your patient. The 5S model provides direct support in the search of evidence-based practice resources. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Supun will take over now uh, to teach you how to search for your evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Marilu, and thank you, Vinga, for the technical support. So uh, let's start uh, my topic, how to search for evidence. 
first we will look into why we search and then we will see where to search and then how to search right why we search now if you can remember a time where you are relaxed and you are in the library or you are browsing through your internet you will just read whatever you find just for your knowledge and remember another time where you saw a patient in the clinic and you want to find out whether your diagnosis is correct or whether you have done the correct management so you go to the library or the you browse through the internet to find out an answer to a specific question and again we search for the evidence or literature for our research purposes in that case we want to know everything under the sun regarding that topic for that we might need assistance of our medical librarian today we are going to focus on how to find answers to a specific question right now you know evidence based medicine uh, to practice that we need clinical expertise which this audience already have and we need best evidence right and then we have to consider patient wishes and values so we will find what is the best evidence now we are to search so as soon as you mention search the first thing that comes to your mind or at least comes to my mind is google right only my wife knows better than google but uh, you can search anything and everything with google right and then when you come to google scholar it is more academic oriented you get articles research articles uh, if you search in google scholar pubmed is the one which the medical community mostly use now if you can remember when prof kumar mendis uh, uh, did his presentation he mentioned that it gives 32 million citations 32 million and the beauty of pubmed is now since last year it has enabled natural language processing which means you can just type your question like you are chatting with the computer and then it will search for you and you can apply so many filters you can apply sex filters age filters and you can apply study filters and timelines so it's a beautiful thing where you can search for your evidence the trip database by the way trip is turning research into practice right you can search evidence there uh, that has two types the free version and the pro version which you have to pay Uh, in the, even in the free version you get two types just search you can just type and search and then you can uh, go for the pico format we are mary lou taught you how to put your question into the pico format you can apply that directly um, in the trip database the trip database searches not only articles in the pubmed but it searches even medical books and blogs so it's important but the thing you have to remember is it does not have natural language processing so when you type you have to be cautious what you type the word you type and your spelling even the new member in the club is meddarx iv this is a server which contains pre appraised evidence for example uh, if you are doing something new with regard to covid and you want to let the world know that you are doing this and you have done this but you can't submit it and uh, the uh, journals will not accept that quickly so you can put it in this server and even the journals like new england journal of medicine uh, when you submit they say uh, they accept the articles in the uh, uh, pre reviewed like this database but it won't be i mean it it will not make sure that it will get accepted right just because you put your research data here 
it will not make sure that the journal will accept it but the world will know that you have done something now this is why the critic your critical appraisal skills is important right because of this kind of databases you can find many studies but they are not pre appraised right so you have to appraise it yourself and everything every one of these searches you have to do if you don't have access to systems or summaries if you if your medical record is linked to something like uh, up to date or bmj best practice you just have to type the diagnosis and you will get in the side panel you will get uh, what to do what is the best evidence with regard to this condition and uh, what investigations you have to do how do you manage right and this is not advertising but professor kumar mendis is trying to do this to his medical record right and then if you have access to summaries like if you have paid subscription to up to date or bmj best practice you don't have to uh, waste your time in uh, google or pubmed you just have to type in up to date or bmj best practice you will get get the best evidence right now all of these are uh, expensive you have to pay then comes the free parts like this okay now like i said previously to search you have to have the clinical knowledge and you have to form the question answerable question in the pico format right now we have discussed why we search we are to search and we will uh, see how to search okay now this is the question i will give you 2 minutes to search whatever the browser uh, you can find please search and you can uh, put your answers in the chat box so this mega dose of vitamin c prevent common cold okay 2 minutes is up now how did you search uh, a link will appear in your zoom chat please click on that link and please tell me just answer how did you search uh we have a can we have that browser uh, displayed to the audience here okay oh that yes people are answering so people have used google they have used google scholar and pubmed yes so most people prefer pubmed it seems which is good right and people are still using google so now uh, let's get back to our slides okay now please see this video uh which i recorded after searching so let's start searching our first question is can mega dose of vitamin c prevent common cold Can you see there are this much of articles 
but within 0.57 seconds. That is the beauty of Google. And there are articles from PubMed right? everywhere. Right? Close. Now let's try Google Scholar. So we type the same question. 3,110 articles within 0.1 second. Right? You can even limit this. Uh, right? You can remove patents or include patents and limit the time. Just a small filter can be applied. Let's try PubMed. Just date results without any filters. If you see this pane, I have not applied any filters, right? And it gives me, uh, the first one it gives is a systematic review from Cochrane database. So the best evidence it presents first. Now you can uh, change the display options, right? Now here we have given most recent and you can put best match. If you put best match, see, uh, still it comes first, right? And then you can click and you, uh, you can uh, apply filters, right? For example, we will put meta analysis. Then only two will remain. Hmm. One of it, and both are from Cochrane database. So let's see the conclusion. Right. When you go click here and then you can get the author's conclusion. Okay. So it says failure of vitamin C supplementation to reduce the incidence of calls in the normal population indicates that routine megadose prophylaxis is not rationally justified for community use. But evidence suggests that it could be justified in people exposed to brief periods of severe physical exercise or cold environments. Okay. So then we will try trip. Now in normal search, we will type the same thing. get 17 results, but look at this. This is regarding age-related cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment and clinical assessment. What happened? So what's wrong? Now in the trip, it's better if you go for the PICO format. Yeah? So population, just Cold intervention and there's no comparison. I will search. Then it gives out the results, right? And this is the primary research. These are from blogs, right? And there's a systematic. So if you want, <clears throat> you can change the display and then you can select. Now, let's say all secondary evidence. So this systematic review will remain and it's from Cochrane. So this is the high quality evidence. So in a trip also, you can uh, select what you want, right? Whether it's a secondary evidence or whether it's a guidance, primary research, right? So you can select those. And that is how 
you search with these resources. Right. If you can remember, I told you that trip does not uh, do natural language processing. That's why in the first search, we had problems that didn't give uh, what we expected. So then we went to the PICO format and then it gave us the results we wanted. Right? So let's start. Now let, the next one. This is from uh, Dr. Mary Lou's slides. And you already formed the question for this scenario. So I will give you again two minutes to search and see what happens. Okay, two minutes up now. Just go through this video. Yeah, I did my search. Okay, now uh, let's see how we can find the answer to this question. So our problem is whether vitamin, vitamin D and calcium can prevent falls in elderly females. Right. First, we search it, and then we have 283 results. So we can apply age and uh, gender filters. To first go to additional filters, select sex. I have already applied. That's why it's visible here. And then go to age filter and. Uh, now in the question it says 78 years so if we click more than 80 and over we don't we will not get a good answer so we will click both these right and show right and then uh, we click these filters if you apply the uh, sex filter we have still 280 results. Now we will apply these two. 80 and over 100. And 65 plus still 253 results. Then, now it, since this is a therapy, we will go for meta-analysis. Still there are 12 results. So, now uh, what we consider is the Cochrane database has the best uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So to select that, we will apply the filter here. Type CDSR within square brackets, text and option, right, TA, and then enter. So you will get three results published in the Cochrane systematic reviews. So then you can go to each of these three and see what they say that's how you decide now uh, you just witnessed how filters can be applied in pubmed right uh, now let's try this one One of your regular patients calls you and asks about taking vitamin D to prevent COVID-19. How will you answer? Right? I will give you two minutes again. Okay, two minutes up. Now let's see how to search. Just please hold on till I switch to the browser. Hang now let's go to PubMed and type COVID-19 and vitamin D. 
or else you can type now i just type these two words if you want uh, you can type like this can vitamin d prevent covid 19 you don't even have to type 19 you just can type covid now let's see what it gives us so there are uh, 267 results now <clears throat> can you see on the top it appears use covid 19 filters from pubmed clinical queries so you can apply those right yes and then search okay will do clinical studies right yeah results see results of clinical studies therapy and broad impact of vitamin d on the cause of covid 19 during pregnancy and likewise there are articles right so uh, there are uh, 141 results likewise you can search and then if you go back hi vitamin d prevent covid 19 we can even apply filters from here now there are uh, 267 results so we will just see whether there are any meta analysis there are right there are eight results uh in meta analysis now we will see whether there is any cochrane uh, articles so, from here right so uh, to find that we will type cdsr within square brackets ta now this uh, tag lines tag words you can find them in the pubmed help section in the appendices it will give these tag lines what to type to uh, limit your search right there are no cochrane articles right right and uh, we'll just go back to these eight you can go through these eight once you click they, that will give the summaries but Uh, to find it whether the, it is the best evidence then you need your critical appraisal skills right now let's go back to our presentation now i uh, pre recorded a video about how to search for this question but i think it's not necessary now that we searched it so i will skip the video now uh, go through this scenario imagine you are in the ward round of dr house right and uh, dr chase and cameron uh, they are having an argument about uh, changing the iv cannula of one of their patients right dr chase says it can it should it can't stay more than 72 hours but cameron is in disagreement house heard them but you know what he says everybody lies he doesn't believe any bit but he turns to you and say you the ebm guy how often do you change the iv cannula so can you find the answer i'll again give you 2 minutes right 2 minutes is up uh, please hold on till i switch on to the browser now before you search your new query please switch off all the filters you have previously applied because pubmed remembers uh, the filters you applied so please clear them and we'll search so what's the question how often do you have to 
change the IV cannula. You just type and see. There are 435 articles, right? So we will limit them. We'll see whether there's, there are any meta-analysis. There's just one, but that uh, it's not very related, of course. So what can we do now? Even though PubMed has natural language processing, it's important when you search uh, to search with synonyms, right? So if you don't find the answer, uh, if you type like this, then you can try synonyms, right? For example, instead of change, we will try replace. Then it gives us 64 results, still too much. Let's try whether there are any meta analysis. Just one, right? But it's regarding neonates. So only the pediatric colleagues will be happy. Others will be a bit unhappy to use this evidence. Then, We'll clear all filters and then try cannulation. Now it gives 380 results. Now we will see whether there are, there are any meta-analysis. There are seven, right? There are seven <clears throat> and even without applying any further filters, you can see the first one is from Cochrane database, right? And you can see the same topic, first and second, same topic. But please see the second one, it says updated, which means, which means this is the first article which was published in 2015 and it was updated. The latest one is from in 2019. So you have to go for that evidence. Uh, to decide what to do, right? Then you can answer Dr. House. Now, again, we will try this uh, in the trip database, right? Go to the Pico. Hmm. Just type IV. Intravenous cannula intervention change. Let's try with these two. There are six results, right? The first one they give is a primary research, and this second one is uh, evidence based synopsis. So we will just click all secondary evidence and see. Yes. Right, and then we will try again cannulation. Right, and see. So it gives primary research, evidence based synopsis, right, and then. If you want, you can limit that to the only to the secondary evidence. But here uh, they don't present the Cochrane uh, article we which we uh, saw in the PubMed. But I'm sure that is something wrong with my uh, searching. Why I didn't use the specific words which is applicable. That's why. This is a bit difficult. Although these this searches uh, more than 
what is available in PubMed. Searching is a bit difficult then when you compare it to PubMed. Right? Uh, now let's go back to the uh, slides. Hi, hi. Now uh, we will skip this part because it is almost similar to what you did. But think of this: one of your friends calls you from USA, and he says that there's a new drug to prevent COVID-19. But he doesn't trust them. He trusts you as a good evidence-based person. And he's asking whether to use this region code. Right? I found this name from a tweet. So I will give you again two minutes to find out. Right. Uh, now let's search for this. Like I said earlier, clear all filters and just type the word. And see, there are eight results, right? So we will try whether there are any meta analysis. No. How about uh, randomized control trials? Yes, one. All right. We'll just clear the filter and see where yeah, these articles are. The first one, it's from New England, England Journal of Medicine. All right. And if you see the second one, it's from MedRxiv database, right? So that's why I said, you can find articles or find evidence, but whether to apply according to the evidence, whether to apply or not, it or not, you have to decide with your uh, knowledge on the study designs and critical appraisal skills basic critical appraisal skills. Now, somebody might question, there is Google, there's Google Scholar, there's PubMed, there's Trip. Where to start the search, right? We usually suggest start from the top. If you have access to systems, that's the best. If not, if you have access to summaries like UpToDate and BMJ best practice, then go for that. If not, start from PubMed or Trip, right? But then there's another question. Now, if you take Sri Lanka, uh, I think only two of our journals are Medline Index, Ceylon Medical Journal and uh, Ceylon Dental Journal, as I can remember. The Journal of uh, Pediatric and Child Health, which is published from our pediatric college, is not indexed in Medline. So if we want to find something in that, where you are going to search? Right? So that's where Google Scholar comes into play. If you search PubMed, you won't get those articles. But if you search Google Scholar or even Google, you will get those articles. So you have to broaden your research. Uh, search. You have to broaden your search according to your requirement. If you are sitting next to a patient, and patient is asking a question and you have to answer within minutes, go for the pre-appraised evidence. And if you have some time, you can search even in the Google Scholar and then find out uh, what you want. And when you find articles in Google Scholar, how much you limit it, you may get sometimes more than 100 articles. So then you can... Uh, copy one of the topics into PubMed and see what that gives. Then you can apply filters, right? And in the PubMed,
there's something called mesh database mesh is medical subject headings you can even uh, search right for example be careful with the spelling so if you search myocardial infarction it gives 10 items right you can even use these things in your searches so that it will limit your search right let's get back onto the slide So it's, in summary, it's really easy to search. Ladies and gentlemen, you just need a good internet connection. You can search PubMed even with your mobile. You can apply filters and search, right? You just need to have a knowledge where to search. And when you find your answers, whether to apply it or not, will depend on uh, your knowledge on critical appraisal and study designs, right? So I hope you will have 1,001 questions, but please post them in the chat. Uh, then we can answer. And since time is running out, I would like to invite Dr. Shihan Silva, a senior lecturer from Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, and also he's the assistant secretary in the today's LMA. Dr. Shan, the forum is yours. Thank you, Supun, thank you. for the thank you, Supun, for the introduction. Thank you, Vyanga. Um, so uh, I I'll be having two talks. I would be going through two important areas. Uh, the first uh, part will be on reviews and guidelines, and then I will be talking about communication and about risks. Um, so this is something that I stumbled upon Facebook, uh, hearsay uh, place of information a couple of days back. Uh, Isaac Asimov was uh, a prolific scientific, uh, science fiction writer, uh, almost equal to Arthur C. Clarke. And, he gives a lovely quotation. He believes in evidence, believe in observation, measurement, reasoning, no matter how wild and ridiculous, if there is evidence for it. The wilder and more ridiculous something is, however, the firmer and more solid the evidence it has to be. So here we are, we, we, we are at the foot of this mountain, mountain of evidence and Supun so rightly pointed out that we have to look at the top and then come down. It's not that we go from bottom upwards, but we have to aim for the sky, the peak, and then we come up. And Mary Lou also went through this, uh, uh, the hierarchy of evidence. Uh, we went through various studies. Um, as you know, uh, the, the peak of it is the meta-analysis, the systemic reviews. And then as we go down from the peak downwards, uh, get the uh, individual RCTs, the cohorts, case control studies, then the case reports and the animals uh, and lab studies. So again, uh, I would like to reiterate the concept of level of evidence and it uh, uh, ranges from one to five based on the Oxford Center of uh, Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, um, where the level one uh, is considered uh, as the top, where systemic reviews of randomized controlled triad, which are homogeneous, are taken at the peak. Then in level one, you have the uh, RCTs, the singular ones, and the, then thereafter the cohort studies in two, the case control studies in number three, 
case series in number four and number five. So this, I think we, we ought to know. Then I take you on to a concept called the grades of recommendation, which you would see most, most of the time in guidelines and in various uh, recommendations you come across, where the green light is given for highly recommendable uh, uh, information, which is of level, which is correlated from level one of this uh, categorization. The uh, yellow is those who those which are favorable, which are which come from level two and three, that is the cohort studies and the, uh, the outcome research, the ecological studies. The amber is favorable, but which are not conclusive coming from level four or any extrapolation coming from the previous level. And certainly when the red light is given, it's neither recommended at any level. If at any level of evidence, it is pointed out that the information shows that it, it is not recommended or it causes harm, it falls into uh, the category of red. So you see that it is not always uh, going in parallel and uh, in um, uh, hand in hand with uh, the levels of recommendation, the grades are different. And you would see this type of a tabulation where there is a mapping or uh, 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 linking up of evidence from the level of evidence into the level of recommendation. This uh, is something that I have taken from, I believe this was from the American College of Cardiologists. And these color codings are uh, essential for us to understand what is recommended and what should not be recommended. Professor Mendis uh, spoke about effects, uh, and I would like to talk a little bit more about effects. There are three words that we need to understand about effects. That's efficacy, effectiveness, and the efficiency. Efficacy is what we gather from uh, the studies that are uh, printed, what comes out. So it is in an ideal circumstance that these uh, data are generated in. It is the intended effect which is seen under ideal circumstances, what you see in print. The effectiveness is what happens when these uh, concepts are placed upon our clinical practice, the theory put into practical or clin uh, clinical uh, setting in the usual clinical setting. And we see that what the effect would uh, arise from that. So you see that something that would be which has efficacy in print, black and white, may, may not have the same effectiveness in our population. Sri Lankans will not have the same effectiveness as of a population which is predominantly white. So how do we get this? This is by observational studies and by qualitative and quantitative, quantitative uh, studies of observational nature that you have to see. So you see that all recommendations, all what you get from print cannot be uh, generalized into every single population. Well, then you come to the third uh, factor for third term, which is called efficiency. That is the worthiness of a therapy in cost to the individual or the society. So you see that it's not only the effectiveness, the, the effect itself, the, how, how it improves, but how cost effective is it? Is it useful uh, in a low uh, income country as of, uh, or middle income country as of ours, or in a resource poor setting? Let's say you can compare it with Colombo or to, with the distant peripheries. So you have to put in all these things. So the most efficacious therapy by best evidence may not be the most cost effective and acceptable method. So systemic reviews, systematic reviews, they are the, uh, they are, they are reviews or a search of comprehensive nature of relevance areas of studies in a particular topic. And they are very well appraised. We will talk about appraisal in the next uh, talk by uh, Professor Shamila De Silva. And these are uh, made in predetermining or explicit 
with us explicit as in they they put out what they really mean by the way that they have searched so systemic systematic reviews have a focused research question just like the way they, how we discuss about the core format the generation so we focus on a particular question and there is a rigorous and reproducible uh, nature so there is a lot of search uh, with regards to uh, what what evidence is there so and also it would have more reproducibility a certain set of people who have done it may have the same have uh, sorry uh, uh, if you take two groups of people who would have would do the systematic reviews in the correct way their their uh, data should come almost equal and they are critically appraised and there is a lot of clarity and precision exact to what the question is answered these these are characteristics of a good systematic review so it th this requires a team which should have experts in it who are who have to be good statisticians uh, bioinformaticians and also who are experts in their fields maybe clinicians maybe academics so it's not only a singular uh, discipline that comes into a play in a systematic review but it's a multidisciplinary approach so as we mentioned uh, you have to have a, a research question and a protocol has to be devised and all relevant evidences should be screened in it and the 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 uh, studies which should be included we are explicitly or uh, with greatest evidence demonstrated that these are the ones are taken and not taken and they are appraised and these are interpreted uh, in finding a balanced and impartial uh, summary meta analysis is actually a way of uh, statistically combining the information that you get in a systematic review and these are uh, these are uh, usually most of time uh, Uh, demonstrated by the use of forest plots which we will talk about later on they give insight into the effectiveness of an intervention and the impact of exposure in a very objective way in comparison to systematic reviews you have the olden day or traditional methods method of narrative literature review what do you mean by term narrative you narrate or you it's like telling a story so uh in comparison to a systematic review there is it's a flexible way of putting out information uh to the reader it is eclectic or it means it's a very comprehensive it, it again just like again just like the systematic review um uh, prints through all the literature that is available from various studies and study types and there is certainly sometimes not much of uh, differentiation of inclusion and exclusion criteria but it's a, it's all pooled in together so and it is sometimes written by a single person sometimes a group but it is most of the time it's not a multidisciplinary approach where you have somebody like a statistician or a person who has been uh, uh, fluent or, or congruent in uh, doing uh, epidemiological or uh, biostatistics so the purpose is to give education to the audience about a particular topic i'll show you an example in so there are no strict guidelines there are guidelines but they are they are as i mentioned they are flexible the the reviewer is able to go beyond boundaries and there is informal and subjective subjective as in it, the the person the expert who writes the review will, will be giving his or her own uh, thoughts uh, into the uh, article so why do we need systematic reviews because it will minimize the bias and errors recently i came across a article which says that 
in comes to science in medicine that there are over 100 biases and errors. So we are all bound to make uh, biases and errors as humans. And certainly in terms of evidence-based medicine, again, even though we, we talk about it as a high level, uh, peak level concept, we, we are bound to fall. So systematic reviews will try to minimize the bias and errors in uh, giving information about a particular topic. And also systematic reviews are very point, uh, point of fact, uh, and they will end confusion. So as I mentioned, uh, formulation of a question and the way that uh, Mary Lou explained about the PICO format, it will be a point of fact answering of a question uh, through the search methods that Supun uh, highlighted. And when somebody does a systematic review, there is uh, revelation of insufficient evidence. Areas that are not covered, areas that have not been addressed, uh, areas that needs to be uh, revealed by further research. Uh, the mitigation of uh, needing, uh, needing uh, further trials. And uh, also it will facilitate, hopefully facilitate rational decision making. The problem with traditional reviews are that it, you can argue on it, that it may be unscientific because there, there are not much of methods of making things explicit or open. And there is a lack of transparency and this concept of re reproducibility where, you know, let's say you have a, a group of uh, experts from a particular country or a culture who do, do a, a narrative review or a traditional review. They may have biases towards particular uh, sociological, cultural uh, concepts in comparison to a totally different a group of individuals who are doing another narrative uh, review. So these are subjective and opinionated and have various uh, 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 data that generate out of this. So a high quality review should have a comprehensive literature review based on evidence-based medicine. We spoke of the Cochrane, we spoke of the midline searches. What about other uh, areas outside allopathic medica uh, medicine, the complementary and alternative medicine, the, the, uh, the, the scientific material that comes out of it, and also the gray literature, things that do not get uh, indexed or published sometimes. PhD theses, the internal reports of various organizations and non-peer review journals. So this is where these things become important. There is a clear predetermined criteria in article selection, this explicit search of uh, information. And there is graded evidence, which we discussed at the beginning, the color coding, the mapping, what you would see in guidelines. And the recommendations are patient-oriented evidence rather than disease-oriented. Because in guidelines, you would see more of disease-oriented approach. I won't go into this. This is what I was speaking about, the, the comparison. So this is a narrative review that I wanted to show. There are many uh, articles that have come out about COVID. I'm sorry if, uh, that it, it looks very small in print, but I just wanted to show you an abstract of a narrative review, which uh, which focuses on, if you go through this article, it will, it is just like reading a textbook. It will talk about the transmission, the background, the transmission, the clinical features, and it will, and it gives opinionated uh, data. Whereas this is one of the uh, uh, systematic reviews I think Professor Shamila De Silva will be talking more on this, but I just wanted to show you a uh, systematic review, the Living Project. 
you see that it is very explicit. So the, the, the abstract itself, I'm, this will be going in two slides. So the abstract itself, it shows the backgrounds. They describe about the methods of finding what kind of information they have uh, taken, what kind of statistics that they have taken. And, and these are ex uh, they, they extensively demonstrated with uh, uh, statistical concepts and about conclusion. And at the end, you would see that it gives uh, even information about uh, conflict of interest of uh, the persons involved in systematic reviews, the, the, the panel of experts, and, um, uh, and also various citations as well. So from reviews, we move on to good clear practical gu guidelines or clinical guidelines, which are very useful in a day and age like this. These are most, most of the time available in our arm um, devices our smartphones useful uh, and uh, in they are less dependent on efficacy studies and because they are they give sort of a summarized uh, set of uh, evidence but you need to be careful in how you use them so they are systematically developed statements which assists uh, the clinician uh, as well as at the patients in making decisions about appropriate healthcare for a specific clinical circumstance. So it is a systematic review and it assesses benefits and harms uh, and uh, that is the purpose of a guideline. So they are based on evidence-based medicine models, the systematic search followed by peer review literature and as I reiterate, they focus specifically about a clinical disorder, let's say like diabetes mellitus, so angina, or about even investigations or even screening. So the object is to improve the clinical uh, or improve medical care. The rationale for these guidelines are that there is a vast amount of information that comes out which are varied. Uh, and opinionated to bring into a unity, a, a, a consensus about how management of a patient ought to be. And also a guideline will always address, a proper guideline will always address the health economics uh, about health care costs and also uh, be of value to cost effectiveness in the society. So it, it facilitates consistency, effectiveness, efficiency to improve the health count outcomes. These are concepts that I spoke of at the beginning. So benefits are these, as we discussed the outcomes, the effectiveness, and also more important, improve the transparency of evidence explicitly uh, the a, prop a good guideline should explicitly demonstrate how that evidence has come and what recommendation could be given. Also, uh, there is a uh, concept of uh, making the clean medical profession or clinicians uh, legitimized or be aware of uh, the various forces that are there in, uh, in, uh, in involvement of patients. Maybe the state, maybe the private sector, the pharmaceutical industries, etc. But as I mentioned, the guidelines can have po uh, potential harm. For instance, a guideline that comes from the USA may not be applicable to our country, to our culture, to our economy, etc. So it can uh, develop it, it can cause uh, escalation of you, use of uh, uh, health related um, costs and uh, also assets. And it can cause costly interventions and not, that are unaffordable uh, and drainage of resources. Also, if the expert panel is not uh, properly formulated and conflicts of interests are not. Uh, revealed, it can again cause harm uh, due to the various external forces. Again, 
external forces such as the state and the pharmaceutical industries and uh, various other agencies can also uh, have an effect on guidelines. So trustworthiness of a uh, standard uh, guideline should have transparency and they should, the second step is that they should manage the conflict of interest. The guideline uh, development group or the expert panel should be uh, explicitly, explicitly uh, demo, uh, stated out and the guidelines uh, should be based on systematic reviews. There should be an intersection in this. And this mapping of the rating strength and the evidence should be given in them. And there should be an external review. So the expert panel doesn't stop there. They should have, they should get an external review team to look at the guideline before it's put out to see whether there is any kind of bias that is uh, uh, present uh, in an unidentified manner. Of course, this is something that is lacking in our guidelines in our country, updating. The constant updating of guidelines is an essential thing. So uh, there should be a set date or set time period as to when these guidelines should be regularly updated. I won't talk about this. So this is the process that the guideline committee, the expert panel, they read, they adopt it, they adapt it, try to adapt it, and they develop the guideline and they go forward. If they cannot adapt the recommendations, there should be rejection. So this is the, the, the protocol that is used, the ADAPT framework, A-D-A-P-T-E framework, where you see the questions are defined, the guidelines are, uh, um, uh, the evidence is searched upon, assessed, selected, adapted, external review, very important in a guideline, and then publishing it and planning for a review and an update in the future. So this is, the, this is an important guideline that is uh, used these days, the living guideline uh, for, of therapeutics and COVID-19 put out by the WHO. You see that all these con this concepts that I spoke of are there in the preamble, the summary, the background, explicit, explicit demonstration of methods, how the guideline was created, the latest evidence, et cetera, and the recommendation. And when you go through the guidelines, you see this color coding. You see that how things are recommended by putting a green light, the IL-6 receptor blockers. You see that ivermectin, we will talk about that in the next session, spoke of, spoken of very, very uh, 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 aptly these days. You see that it is, stated as useful only in research study. And then the hydroxychloroquine which has been taken out the in red and various other uh, antivirals. And you see that an, a guideline should also be able to put out their uncertainties, their limitations, and what future research should be planned upon. So these are also parts of a good guideline. Medicine is an ever-changing field. This is something that was attributed to David Sackett, but uh, uh, it is also attributed to William Osler as well. At one time, uh, somebody, one of the two have said, half of what you learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of graduation. Trouble is we do not know what it is. We need to check on the validity. So check on the comprehensiveness, the reproducibility, and look at the literature and see whether all those recommendations that are put out in the guidelines are tagged or mapped to a level of evidence. There are killer bees in it, in each guideline. So whenever you come across a guideline, let's say from UK or US, see whether the guideline is 
uh, useful as a burden of disease. Let's say we are talking about a condition like, uh, uh, let's say like uh, familial Mediterranean fever. Is that guideline useful to us? Is the burden of disease uh, applicable to our city? Are the beliefs of the individual or the community uh, going in par with the intervention? A study might say uh, that particular drug which is taken from, let's say, uh, uh, porcine origin from a, from a pig uh, can be used for a particular uh, uh, population. So there may be a cultural uh, uh, incongruency. So we need to be uh, remember evidence based medicine is not only just science with literature search and your clinical expertise, you need to think about the patient concerns as well. Is there a bad bargain in the opportunity of cost? Just because we are doing this uh, intervention, are we curtailing uh, costs or assets that can be channeled to a more important, more relevant uh, disease which is there in the community? And are there any barriers which we can uh, overcome before implementing this? Is it geographic? Is it a legal thing? That's the biggest problem. Sometimes you, you, you may have an intervention which you cannot enforce or you cannot uh, 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 facilitate or use on a particular community because of legal constraints. So these are some of the Sri Lankan guidelines that are there, time-tested guideline on vaccines. Of course, you don't see that color mapping in any of these, even the national antibiotic guidelines. These two documents are very useful, but unfortunately, I think it's time for us, for the groups to think about this mapping of grading and to be a little bit more explicit in their strategies. There are alternatives to evidence-based medicine. This was an article that was put out in 1999. Uh, and uh, there are seven alternatives. I, I end with these seven uh, quickly. Eminence-based medicine. More senior or popular the colleague, okay, the halo effect or let's say we consider as God effect. The modified Kalama Sutra, we spoke of uh, uh, the, think about the professor or the college uh, big person. So is, are we basing our treatment or practice on this eminence? Is it on vehemence based medicine? Are we giving time uh, and space for somebody who speaks so, uh, garrulously, like the individual who is there in this picture. Is it based on eloquence or elegance? Smooth tongue, sartorial elegance. You don't have to have a sartorial elegance. I, I don't have to uh, be more evident in it with the picture, uh, but uh, talking is enough. If we don't have an idea to do what is next, are we uh, lay, laying the, uh, uh, the decision uh, upon the supernatural or the occult? We, do, we don't not know what to do, and then we have a sense of despair. And then we are uh, having uh, uh, diffidence. But to do nothing may be better than doing something. Pride is hurt to do something. Are we doing it in fear of litigation? Are we asking for various tests because we are scared that somebody would come and ask, doctor, oh, you didn't do this at this particular time. Uh, therefore, I, I, you might think, okay, um, you, you may be sued. So over investigation and over treatment. And then confidence-based medicine, where we do not have an open mind. And when we uh, look upon things, only in a focused, uh, very rigid way. So the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade. It's a calling, it's a uh, not a business. You have to have the head as well as the heart to work on medicine. 
So I end my first talk with that and I then move on to the second part. So risks, we talk about risks. So when we hear about the word risk, is it always to do with uh, danger? Not so. Risk is a equal to chance. That's what is there in medicine. So in communication, there is a uh, interflow between inf uh, the, the, the sender and the re receiver. And there is a lot of information that gets uh, dissipated as noise or it gets lost. And you see it's only a fraction of this message that goes across into the uh, receiver. We had a uh, very successful workshop on uh, communication two days back. I hope you know the, base, the concepts of communication and the importance of uh, the psychological and the, uh, uh, the theoretical part uh, regarding uh, communication, which I won't talk into. So it is the effective uh, decision-making process which is based on effective risk communication. And this is what everybody should develop these days. So it has different dimensions and uncertainties and com communication becomes very difficult. So you see that when somebody gives high level of care with high level of competence, that is when our patients would have trust in us. When we have, when we give high level of affection in care with low level of uh, 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 competence, we have affection coming. When we have low level of care and low level of competence, that's where distrust comes in. And when we have high level of competence, but with low level of care, our patients will fear or will have some animosity towards us. So medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So we we deal with various figures, very risks, etc. And it is uh, important that we uh, stress on our patients that virtually all treatment can have some sort of risk. So it's truthfulness, reflect upon veracity. Truthfulness is essential when we talk about com communicating risks. And it is essential that we also talk about the professional uncertainties. Maybe it may be because of individual uh, issues or collective issues, which uh, are uh, factors of human error. Or it can be because of certain uh, uh, reasons which, which are beyond our control. We use this concept of acts of God uh, in uh, risk sciences, especially in terms of insurance uh, and finance industries. So these are things which are beyond human control. But in all communication, reassurance of care provided and confidence should be given. So doctors need more training in communicating risks and more risk, uh, research is needed. This is a quotation that was there in the ward that I worked in UK in Cambridge. Uh, as I entered the ward every day, I used to see this above all to thine own self be true. Thou canst not be false to any man. That is essential thing. We need to be open to our patients, but we also need to be open to ourselves. What we read from literature, we need to find out whatever we read from med as medical evidence. Is it true? Are we taking it in a true form? So that's the basis of communication. The, the concept of communication starts from you and you alone. So we have a randomized control trial. Imagine that there are two groups uh, which are divided as intervention and control. The intervention uh, group is made, uh, given a particular drug and we derive absolute uh, risk or the event rate of a particular uh, event that is happening because of this uh, risk, the, 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 the intervention that has been done. So you have in the control event, 
the control group, the control event rate, which is the risk of outcome event, and uh, the experimental event rate, which is there in the uh, uh, experimental group. So it involves people who are affected, whether they are exposed or not exposed. These are absolute risks. So in this study, let's assume that there were 90 out of 100 who, of those who were not receiving the drug of the control group that have got the disease. So that's an absolute value. And 60 out of 100 of those getting the drug or the experimental group that have got the disease. So you calculate the control event rate uh, in the, the, the control group, which comes as 90% or 0.9 as evident. And in the experimental event uh, rate, in the experimental group as 60% from the uh, information that we have given. Then we need to know about this concept of relative risk, which compares risk of having an in event between two groups. So the, it's a ratio between the uh, experimental group and the control group, the exposed group and the non-exposed group. And you get a value of 0.67, that is by dividing 0.6 over 0.9 from our data. And it is the probability of an event occurring in the exposed group to the probability of event occurring in comparison in the non-exposed group. So what does, how do we deal with it? So when, when we have a relative risk, if, if the outcome is a bad outcome, adverse outcome, and if the relative risk is less than one, the new intervention is better. Like in our study, what we have done. If it is unity or one, the intervention is no better or worse, it's the same. If the in, uh, re, uh, value is more than one, the inter intervention causes harm. Likewise, uh, in a bene ben beneficial outcome, let's say like stopping smoking, if the intervention was less than uh, one, the, or the relative risk was less than one, the new intervention is making worse. If it's more than one, the new intervention is better. Concept of odds ratio. So incidence rates cannot be generated in case control studies because it's a case control studies are retrospective studies. So the alternative to relative risks in case control studies is this odds ratio. So what do you mean by the term odds? Odds, odds is a concept that comes in the gambling industry or bet betting industry where you give a figure as the ratio between uh, those who have and who do not have. So it's not, uh, it's just absolute fig figures. So if you take this two by two table of exposed and not exposed with developing disease and do not having disease, and you give A, B, C, D as it is, the odds of exposed person developing a disease is A into B, A over B. The odds of non-exposed person developing disease is C into C over D. So therefore the odds ratio of the exposed to non-exposed is A divided by D, B divided by C divided by D. And therefore you see this concept, uh, mathematical concept of cross multiplication and they get AD divided by BC. So this is the background. I'm sure most of you know about this. The relative risk reduction is the reduction of the rate of the event in the treatment group in relation to the control group. So it is taken as one minus relative risk. So it tells you how much the treatment has reduced the risk in the interventional group in relation to the control group. How much the uh, risk of the event has come down in the uh, interventional group compared to the control group. So in our previous uh, data, you see it's one minus 0.67, which is 0.33, and that comes to one third. Concept of absolute risk reduction. I want you to concentrate on this uh, white area where it says incidence in the exposed group or the, the, the interventional group. It is composed of those who 
uh, have got the disease or the incidence in the exposed because of the exposure, plus those who have got the uh, have had the incidence because of not not merely because of the exposure. So somebody just because that person was exposed to the uh, drug or to that particular risk may or may not develop uh, the particular disease. It's purely by chance. So absolute risk reduction is the, the difference between the control ex event rate uh, and the uh, experimental event rate. And it gives a figure of the amount of disease that can be attributed or that is caused by the exposure. Then in, the, in studies, you come across a concept called numbers needed to treat, where numbers of people who are treated uh, uh, are calculated in benefit of one person. So, so in our study, in this data, you see that the, the, the figure is derived from the reciprocal law absolute, uh, attributable risk reduction. So one over ARR. So one divided by point 0.3, that comes to 3.3 or roughly three. So three patients had to be treated with the drug to avoid one additional disease occurrence. So this is an important thing that you have to know because this is, when you are talking about numbers needed to treat and this absolute risk reduction, those are the two important risks that you need to convey to your patients. So uh, you have to be concise. You have to be clear about how you're explaining. So when you're taking absolute risk reduction into the patient's concept con uh, uh, context, what you try to say is, okay, by giving this drug or by doing this intervention, just be purely by doing this, this is the amount of risk that is reduced in an absolute risk reduction. But in the number of in number needed to treat, you talk about how many people you have to treat to avoid one disease occurrence in such a patient. Of course, a little bit about p-values, you have to know the probability values because it will tell how much the study could have occurred by chance. And by, uh, cons uh, by consensus, you take a value of 0.5 less than 0 0.05 is taken as a statistically significant result. I believe you understand this. And the confidence interval is the range where one can give 95% uh, confidence or sureness that, that the value of that particular uh, risk lies for the whole population. So it's an indication of precision or accuracy, strength, and the statistical uh, significance. So we come to this forest plot that we spoke of in meta-analysis, and you see that in this uh, study, there are, there are uh, two studies which have crossed the level line of one. The level line of one is the demarcation between favoring uh, the control, favoring the treatment. And you see there are two, two trials, uh, th sorry, three trials that have crossed uh, the, the, the line of unity. And therefore, those are, uh, those are uh, studies that we have to be careful of, which have uh, shown no significance. Of course, the, the cumulative value or the, the diamond that is there in the bottom is the indication that when we do the systematic review that all these studies are cumulatively saying that this treatment is more in favor of uh, ca causing uh, beneficial results in terms of the controls. So when you're talking, when you are communicating about risks to your patients, you have to use simple language. Think that you're talking uh, to a, per a person or a child who is in grade eight, low literacy uh, concept. And you reduce clinical and statistical jargon all what I have been talking, the risk, et cetera. And then you have to come to that small child's level. Try to use logical sequences and focus information and use pictures. 
we'll talk about that in a little bit. So writing in plain language is a challenge for some. Speaking in plain language can be more difficult. Try to avoid very descriptive terms which are arbitrary, right? So when you say low or high, how does it mean? Same concept comes in uh, medical education. Now we don't use the word like common, uh, rarely, etc. When we when we de devise uh, multiple choice uh, que questions, so we try try as much as possible to dis avoid descriptive terms because those descriptive terms may be are, are likely reflective on the sender's uh, thoughts rather than the receiver's thoughts. Thoughts. There have been uh, attempts to standardize vocabulary. For instance, this table is a uh, nomenclature that was uh, used in the European uh, Union, European Commission of Nomenclature, where common, very, co very common, common, co uncommon, rare, very rare have been given rates, and these have been used. But, but these shades of adjectives, these, these descriptive terms, differ from country to country, community to community, and culture to culture. Same way you can use uh, these numerical uh, or graphical ways where you say risk, what I mean is one in 100, one in 10, which when you're saying very, very negligible risk is one in trillion, etc. So use, try to use a, a, a scale like this when you are trying to convey the risk to your patient. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can use something like this. This is a, uh, the a description of how hazardous healthcare is. And you see that healthcare uh, is uh, quite, quite dangerous in losing life, lives uh, in comparison to mountain climbing or even nuclear power accidents or even a yeah, yeah, 747 coming down. But if you are not very careful in using this graph, you can cause a lot of harm. You see that the two axes are not linear axes. You see that they are logarithmic axes. So from one, it goes to 10, from 10, it goes to 100, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000. So be careful on the graphical uh, modes that you use on your patient because patients will think, ah, okay, it's just only if you compare uh, the risk of some healthcare related thing divided by mountain climbing, it's only thousand times of a risk, but it is, but graphically the patient will not understand, the, the receiver will not understand these terms. So be careful on this. Use a consistent denominator. So don't go by telling the patient, okay, mean, uh, that this study is this one person said that is one in 200, and then another person said one in 25. Patients are, people are not able to compare these de denominators. So get them into a uniformity. Make it a thousand or a hundred, 40 out of 100. Five out of a uh, thousand, sorry, 40 out of a thousand or five out of a thousand, etc. Unify what you're talking and be consistent. And also, uh, do not give only the negative or the positive uh, aspects of treatment or uh, uh, intervention, uh, because that will give the receiver some sort of a prejudice or some sort of a fixed focus on what. Uh, they are taking. So loss of framing, this is called framing effect. This is a, also again a bias that is spoken of in medical uh, sciences. So try to give the negative as well as the positive aspects, positive, uh, the negatives of being cured, the positives of uh, being cured, negatives uh, of dying, positives of living with uh, give and take. Uh, risk benefits, etc. One picture is worth a thousand words. So, a person who has poor numeracy or statistical skills will need a boost from visual skills. Uh, this is something that you can try on. There is a site called the nntonline.net. 
it's called the Kate's plot, where you can put whatever study that you have come across read in your practice into visual format. For instance, I have put in uh, this uh, about the in, in impact of uh, a statin on cardiovascular disease. And you put in all these things, the outcome, the duration that you are thinking of, the various con uh, confidence intervals, etc. And then you come with this. So it gives a, a graphical representation of what you are talking about. You can easily do it in your smartphone. So you see that in the control group, which doesn't take the statin, you see that there are 13 red faces, bad faces who have bad outcome. And you in the treatment group, three out of those red uh, uh, faces are yellows, just to show that these are the three who have been uh, uh, been beneficial out of taking the statin. So this is something that is easy for your patients to understand what you're talking about. Another example, I won't go into each and every detail here. So imagine that you have somebody who comes to your clinic and uh, these are the figures that you have a 64 year old who has hypertension, cholesterol, diabetic with this much of control, creatinine, non-smoker, et cetera. And patient may be asking you, what is his risk of vascular events in the future? So this is one out of many that comes across in uh, your, your uh, phone or your computer. Of course, you have to be mindful that these may be uh, uh, calculators which are uh, uh, applicable to various other populations. But then again, they may be able to convey some sort of risk and benefit to the patient. So you substitute these values in this website and then you get again a case plot. You see the, 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 the figure that you get is your risk of having a heart attack or stroke within the next 10 years is 28.1%. So, in other words, you can tell when you take 100 people with the same risk factors that you would have, 28 are likely to have a heart attack or stroke within a five, uh, 10 year or five year uh, period, whatever you have put it in. So this is something that is uh, useful for the patient. Of course, you can also use various other graphical uh, methods, but be very careful how you do describe them. For instance, the bottom uh, one is the, the initial pie chart that was used by not, uh, Nightingale. Apparently, Florence Nightingale is attributed as the uh, person who, um, who introduced this concept of pie charts. Uh, but you see that that chart is very, very difficult for a patient to uh, decipher or for, even for you to decipher the first group. But then again, simple bar charts or simple, simple pie charts will be the best. Simplicity is the best. Frequencies or is it percentages? Generally, for low numeracy participants, go by uh, frequencies because frequencies will tell, okay, this much of patients for this much of uh, people who are at risk. Percentages are very abstract. They are, they are sort of, they, are, they need a little bit of a higher level thinking, okay? You need a little bit of math, thing, math going into your head. So it will not be very easy. So bring the percentages down into frequencies or absolute values. Talk about both the baseline risk as well as the risk for treatment. We spoke of this in the concept of absolute, treat, uh, absolute risk calculation, absolute risk reduction calculation, where you have to tell, okay, even if you are given the medicine or not given or whatever, there are risks of developing this disease which cannot be uh, accounted because of various reasons. Maybe because of human uh, reasons, or it may be because of your uh, natural reasons, as we say, acts of God. So, always give the incremental risk, 
the the risks or benefits that are caused by the intervention along with the baseline primacy and recency is when you when you give uh, some sort of uh, advice risk you would get this primacy where when you when you talk about something first the patient will per, any person will take that first bit of information right into the head when and the middle part is lost even like a lecture and the last bit of the lecture or the, the communication the per, per person will be taking into head so this is called the primacy and recency effect these are psychological concepts so so the middle part may be lost so it's essential that the information that is given is reiterated and summarized in every way and come to the concept of less is better. Try to compare two arms instead of many. You see that in the bar, bar chart uh, that you would see on your left side that uh, the uh, particular cancer therapy, it has compared no additional therapy, hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, and chemo hormonal therapy. So it's a lot of information for the patient to take into head. But you bring it down, okay. First, let's compare between hormonal and hormonal and chemotherapy. Let's compare with chemotherapy and chemo and hormonal therapy, like and so forth. So less is better. Make sure that the patient understands each and every step. So coming to the last part of the lecture, in, there should be care in risk communication where C is citing the basic risk data in general terms. Talk in simple language to, the, to a grade five, uh, grade eight uh, numeracy or child's level. Give the probabilities, add the probabilities by A uh, to, in descriptive terms to be more, more and more descriptive, but try to avoid things like high, low, rare, common, etc. Reinforce this effectiveness by usage of visual aids. And then finally give hope. Don't forget that the th third part of the evidence-based medicine where patient is essential. What are the patient's concerns? What are the patient's expectations? And give hope, reassure of help available. I end with this. One of the essential qualities of the clinician in interest in uh, in humanity, his interest in humanity for the secret of care of the patient is in the caring of the patient. Let's not be fooled, let's, let not, let's not be misled by just numbers and evidence that we come across. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome the next speaker who is Professor Shamila De Silva. I, um, uh, it's a privilege for her, me to introduce her because she was my trainer when I was a registrar and senior registrar. She is the professor in uh, professor in medicine of Faculty of Medical uh, Medicine, University of Caledonia, and she will be doing about appraisal of it. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Shehan, for that introduction. Uh, my disclosures, uh, yes, I am a clinician and I am currently working in a hospital swamped by COVID. So I do have some, um, some uh, uh, ability to talk about uh, um, COVID-based problems. And no, I'm not an expert in evidence-based medicine, but I'm a living example of somebody who can be a clinician who can practice evidence-based medicine to some extent during their clinical work. So I will talk about critical appraisal in evidence-based medicine. Let us first define what is critical appraisal. It is a process of carefully and systematically examining research to judge its trustworthiness, value, and relevance in a particular con context. Critical appraisal allows us to reduce information overload by eliminating irrelevant or weak studies, identify the most relevant papers, distinguish evidence from opinions, assumptions, misreporting and belief, 
assess the validity of the study, assess the usefulness and clinical applicability of the study, and recognize the potential for bias. I will take you through an overview of how to critically appraise a paper and what are the aspects to look at in each part of a paper. And then we will do a practical application of that in a standard study and then move on to an RCT and a systematic review and see how to critically analyze all of those things in a practical way. So how to critically analyze, appraise a paper. The initial questions that you have to ask yourself is, is the study question relevant to my field? Does the study add anything new to the evidence in my field? What type of research question is being asked? You know exactly how a research question should be framed using the PICO framework and what is the type of research question that is being asked? Is the study design appropriate for that research question? Does the methodology address important potential sources of bias? Bias can be attributed to chance, which is random error, or to the study method, which is systematic bias. Was the study performed according to the original protocol? Deviations from the planned protocol can affect the validity and the relevance of the study. Then you have to see whether the study tests the stated hypothesis. There should be a clear statement what the investigators expect the study to find, which can be tested and confirmed or refuted. A clear hypothesis. And then look at whether the statistical analysis was performed correctly. You don't have to be a statistician, but you have to be a clinician with some idea of statistics. Do the data justify the conclusions? That you have to be very careful about because sometimes definite conclusions are based on statistically insignificant results. Generalized findings may be given from small sample sizes and statistically insignificant associations may be misinterpreted to imply a cause and effect. So you have to be careful of these pitfalls. Finally, Look for any conflicts of interest. Who funded the study? Can we trust their objectivity, particularly when pharma industry is involved? Do the authors have any potential conflicts of interest? Have they been declared? Look at the bottom of the paper for these things. And finally, the most important question, will the results help me manage my patients? That is what we as clinicians must always ask ourselves. So if we are to break down the paper, an overview of the paper, you take the paper into your hand, you want to critically analyze this paper, critically assess this paper, do an overview of the paper. Look at the publishing journal and the year. Is the journal a good journal from a reputed publisher or is it a predatory journal? What is the year of publication? Is it a recent article or is it a very old article? What is the article title? Does it state the key objectives? The authors and their institutions, also important. Peer review, does this journal have a peer review process? If not, you have to be a bit careful. Authors declarations of interest and potential market bias, we already talked about that. Also usually available in the first page of the article. Then look at the abstract. Reading the abstract is a quick way of getting to know the article and its purpose, major procedures and methods, main findings and conclusions. As you know, the abstract is usually divided into aims, material and methods, results and conclusions. A lot of us hardly proceed beyond the abstract. And even in the abstract, most of us look only at the conclusions. That is not really very correct. We should be at least reading the full abstract before deciding whether or not we want to continue reading the article. Then we move on to the introduction or the background section. This usually references earlier work related to the area under discussion and expresses the importance and limitations of what is previously acknowledged. It addresses why this study is considered necessary, what is the purpose of this study, 
and what has been already achieved and how does this study be at variance. So these are the points that you have to look at when you're looking at the introduction. So how do we critically appraise the introduction of a study? Does the article attempt to answer the same question as your clinical question? Is the article recently published within the last five years? Or is it a seminal article, an earlier article, but which has strongly influenced later development? Articles that are older, 10 years, 15 years older, may not be that relevant in the current context. Is the journal peer reviewed? Very, very important. Do not get caught up in uh, journals which are not peer reviewed or predatory journals. Do the authors present a hypothesis? If any of these four questions are answered as no, then you should return to your search and attempt to find an article that will meet these criteria. So these four uh, questions are very important when you're looking at the introduction to decide whether or not you want to continue reading this article. How do you critically appraise the methods, the second section in any publication? Is the study design valid for your question? Are both inclusion and exclusion criteria described? Is there an attempt to limit bias in the selection of participant groups? Are there methodological protocols such as blinding used to limit other possible bias? Do the research methods limit the influence of confounding variables? Are the outcome measures valid for the health condition you're searching? Remember, there are a lot of biases in any publication that you have to be very concerned about. And you also have to be concerned about confounding variables. So these are two areas that you have to pay a lot of attention to in the methods section. Then the critical appraisal of the results. There should be a table that describes the subject's demographics and the baseline demographics between the groups, the control and the intervention groups or any other groups should be broadly similar. Look for that table, that is usually table one. Are the subjects generalizable to your patients? This is a problem that we have in our kind of country, uh, which is a developing country. Subjects are sometimes not generalizable to our kind of patients. Are the statistical tests appropriate for the study design and clinical question? Are the results presented within the paper? They should be within the paper. Are the results statistically significant? Even if they are significant, how large is the difference between the groups? Is there evidence of significance fishing, changing the tests to ensure significance? Be careful of that. And then look at the discussion section. A good discussion section should show an absolute comparison of what is already identified in the topic of interest and the clinical relevance of what has been newly established. And, the, and there should be a discussion on limitations of the study and the necessity for further studies. There should be something about intention to treat analysis. And there should be something about ad addressing potential biases. And are the interpretations consistent with the results? Are the null findings interpreted? How do the findings relate to previous work? Is there external validity? Can the findings be generalized to the general population? Uh, what are the results, outcomes, findings that are applicable to and will they affect clinical practice? Does the conclusion answer the study question? Is the conclusion convincing? Also look at ethics ethical approval, ethical issues, and then see, finally, do the results apply to the population in which you are interested, your patients? Can you use the results of the study in your practice? So when you're critically appraising the discussion and the conclusion, see whether the authors are attempting to contextualize non-significant data in an attempt to portray significance talking about findings which had a trend towards stick significance as if they were significant. You'd be surprised at how many studies are actually doing this. Do the authors acknowledge the limitations in the article? Are there any conflicts of interest noted? Okay, so that is our theory. Now let's 
look at this study. This is a recent study, uh, retrospective analysis of a publication on ivermectin. Use of ivermectin is associated with lower mortality in hospitalized patients with coronavirus disease 2019. This is a study that came out of Florida. It was done in uh, four uh, hospitals in Florida. It was a retrospective analysis, retrospective observational study, where they looked at charts of patients who had been admitted to four hospitals and who had been treated with ivermectin. Some had been treated with ivermectin, some had not been treated with ivermectin. They did a retrospective analysis to see what had happened, what was the outcome. So all the patients were patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. They categorized the disease and all the patients were given ivermectin. Those who were given ivermectin were given at the physician's discretion. So some physicians gave ivermectin, some physicians did not. It was given at the physician's discretion. And the outcome was death from COVID pneumonia and they, they had a various number of other uh, uh, complete resolution death and they had a number of other secondary outcomes as well. And all the patients received a combination of various other treatments as well. Chloroquine, azithromycin, various other treatments were also received. Remember, this was a retrospective analysis. And at the end, they said, that ivermectin is associated with lower mortality in hospitalized patients who received, uh, who received ivermectin. And therefore, uh, the number needed to treat was about eight patients to get a good result. So let's apply what we talked about before to this study and critically appraise this study to see how good it is. The introduction. Does the article attempt to answer the same question as your clinical question? Does ivermectin reduce mortality in patients with COVID pneumonia? Yes, the article is trying to answer that question. Is the article recently published? Yes, 2021. Is the journal peer reviewed? Yes. Do the authors present a hypothesis? Yes, they do. So these four questions are answered. We should go on to reading the rest of the article. Is the study design valid for your question? Now, that is a bit of a problem. This is a retrospective analysis, observational study, and ivermectin is used at physician discretion. The dosing is different. The number of days it was used in individual patients is different. There is wide variation. Are both exclusion and inclusion criteria described? Not very clearly, not completely to an extent. Is there an attempt to limit bias in the selection of participant groups? No. Are the methodological protocols blinding used to limit other possible bias? No. Do the research methods limit the influence of confounding variables? A vehement? No. Are the outcome measures valid for the health condition you are researching? Yes. The outcome measures are valid, but the study itself is flawed. So if we are to quote only this study and say that ivermectin is a good drug to treat COVID pneumonia, it is not a good way of analyzing research. Okay, now that is a single study, one of study. Let's move on to the critical appraisal of randomized control trials. Multiple factors that you have to look for when you're critically appraising a RCT, allocation, blinding, follow-up, data collection, sample size, presentation of results, applicability to the local population, multiple factors have to be looked at. And I think most of you are already familiar how a RCT should be reported according to the consort guidelines. So I'm not going to go into this. Now, there are tools available online, Critical Appraisal Skills Program, CASP. This is an online uh, tool that is available in the uh, Evidence-Based Medicine Oxford 
uh, database in the website. This is freely downloadable, freely usable. It's a very easy to use critical appraisal tool to critically appraise an RCT. There are four sections and each of the sections assess different parts of an RCT. And you can easily use this with whatever the RCT that you want to look at. And I will, we will go through an RCT using this and we will see how easy it is to critically appraise that RCT. Is the basic study design valid for a randomized control trial? That is section A. Then we look at whether the study was methodologically sound in section B, then results in C, and will the results help locally in section D? The first three questions in section A are screening questions about the validity of the basic study. And if they are okay, if the first three questions are okay only, you should be moving on to the rest of the sections. So the first three questions in section A, is the basic study design valid for an RCT? The three questions, did the study address a clearly focused research question? Was the assessment of participants to interventions randomized? And were participants who entered the study accounted for at the conclusion, intention to treat analysis? Those three have to be answered. And if all three are yes, Yes, you should move on to the rest of the study. Section B was the study methodologically sound. You're looking at were the participants blind, the blinding, the investigators blinded, were the study groups similar at the start of the RCT? And apart from the experimental intervention, did each study group receive the same level of care? Were they treated equally? So that is B. C is what were the results, were the effects of intervention reported comprehensively and were the confidence intervals reported and do the benefits of the experimental intervention outweigh the harms and costs, that's C. Then D will be, will the results help locally? Can the results be applied to your local population in your context? Would the experimental intervention provide greater value to the people in your care than any of the existing interventions? These two are extremely important in our context in a limited resource setting. So right, let's use this framework to critically appraise a recent RCT a somewhat controversial recent RCT on COVID-19, Remdesivir. In adults with severe COVID-19, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter trial. This trial was in a, a multicenter trial in a number of hospitals in Hubei, China. Uh, it was conducted in, in a Chinese population, but the drug was supplied by a drug company in the United States. You had to read the whole article to get at this little point that is hidden somewhere within the article. Uh, the patients who were eligible patients were over 18s who were uh, admitted with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection with pneumonia. They had strict criteria, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the outcome were uh, the patients were randomized and then the outcome was they were all they also received other treatments and the outcome that was uh, they were looking for was improvement time to clinical improvement up to day 28 uh, from the date of randomization time to clinical improvement that was the primary outcome and then they also looked at a number of secondary outcomes so they uh, randomized a fair number of uh, people uh, there were 158 randomized to remdesivir and 79 to placebo. And remdesivir was, not, uh, remdesivir was not associated with the difference in time to clinical improvement. And they also say, although not statistically significant, patients receiving remdesivir had a numerically faster time to clinical improvement than those receiving placebo. So the interpretation was that in this study of adult patients admitted to hospital with severe COVID-19, remdesivir was not associated with statistically significant clinical benefit. However, the numerical reduction in time to clinical improvement in those treated earlier requires confirmation in larger trials. So 
this in effect was not really a positive result. But for some reason, this trial was received with a lot of positive positivity. And in fact, after about a few days, the FDA actually received their, uh, revised their guidance on remdesivir based on this study. So it, it's a bit difficult to understand how this happened. Let's put this trial through our critical appraisal. Section A, basic study design valid for a RCT. Did the study address a clearly focused research question? Yes, it did. Was the assessment of participants to interventions randomized? Yes, they were. Were all participants who entered the study accounted for at the conclusion? Yes, they were. As you can see, there was a certain number who dropped out in both arms, but they were accounted for. Then the method methodologically soundness of the study. Were the participants blind? Yes. Were the investigators blind? Yes. Were the people assessing, analyzing outcomes blind? That was not mentioned anywhere. Were the study groups similar at the start of the RCT? Yes, they were. Apart from the experimental intervention, did each group receive the same level of care? Yes, they did. So up to now, no problems. It's going okay. Then we start getting a few problems. Were the effects of intervention reported comprehensively? Yes, it was reported quite comprehensively. Power calculations, outcomes measured, if they were clearly specified, they were all measured. Was the precision of the estimate of the intervention on treatment effect reported? Yes, it was reported. Do the benefits of the experimental intervention outweigh the harms and the costs? Here is the crunch. They don't. They do not. Remdesivir is very expensive and the trial actually did not show a definitive benefit. Then section D, will the results help locally? Can the results be applied to your local population? No. Would the experimental intervention provide greater value to your people in your care? Definitively, no. So as you can see, if you read the article carefully, and if you apply this particular way of assessing the trial, critically analyzing these trials, it's very easy, even with an RCT, to figure out whether it is relevant, whether it's useful, whether it is relevant or not, in a few easy steps. Then let's move on to a critical appraisal of a systematic review. Shehan has already told you what a systematic review is. It's a, it provides an overview of all primary studies in a topic and tries to obtain an overall picture of the re results. So the primary studies are identified, critically appraised, and only the best ones are selected. And a meta-analysis of the results from the selected studies is usually in included. Factors to look for, how was the literature search done? The quality control of the study is included. Homogeneity of studies, they should be fairly similar. Presentation of results and applicability to the local population. Already touched on, so I will move on to actually applying critical appraisal to a systematic analysis. Guidelines for preferred reporting items for systematic reviews or the meta-analysis, the PRISMA guidelines. Again, I'm sure most of you are aware of this. This is how systematic reviews are presented usually. So how do we critically appraise a systematic review? Again, CASP has an online tool, very easy to use. Three sections, are the results of the study valid, section A? What are the results, section B? And will the results help locally, section three? The first two questions are screening questions and can be answered quickly. If the answer to both is yes, it is worth proceeding. If at least one answer is no, abandon the systematic review, go on to something else. Right, so the first one, are the results of the review valid? Uh, did the review address a clearly focused question? That is the first one. Did the authors look for the right type of papers? That is the second one. So those two questions have to be answered, yes, before you move on to the rest. So is it worth continuing? The third part is, uh, do you, 
very difficult to see. Do you think all the important and relevant studies were included? That is the C. Then did the review reviews authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? Then if the results of the review uh, have been combined, was it uh, reasonable to do so? Meaning were the studies similar enough for the results to be combined? And then what are the overall results of the review? And how precise are those results? And then finally, can the results be applied locally? Can the results be applied to the local population? Uh, and what are, the, uh, what are the important outcomes that have been considered, et cetera? So those are the sections that you have to be looking at. So finally, let's apply this critical appraisal to a recent systematic review on COVID-19 on tocilizumab treatment for COVID-19 patients, a systematic review and a meta-analysis. Now, this came out very recently and it's looking at, uh, it ha they have actually looked at a very large number of studies, but they have filtered it down to about 25 large studies from which they have done the systematic uh, review and they have also conducted a meta-analysis. And the conclusion is that toslizumab is a good treatment and it improves prognosis and improves pneumonia in participants with COVID-19. So let's apply what we talked of before. Section A, are the results of the review valid? Did the review address a clearly identified question? Yes, it did, it did. It looked at a very clearly identified question. Is this drug useful in this particular context? And did the authors look for the right type of papers? They had done a very good literature search. They had selected a large number of studies using and they have given the way they did the search as well. So is it worth continuing? Did the, uh, did the authors look at all the papers who, that they could have used? They had looked at most of the papers. Only thing they have only looked at papers in English, not looked at any other language papers. Did the review's authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? They have gone into a lot of detail. They have given a lot of information of how quality was, was assured in individual papers that they selected. If the results of the reviews have been combined, was it reasonable to do so? They have given uh, uh, how they combined and why they combined and what they combined. So it seemed very reasonable. Again, it seemed okay. So those are two of the things that that uh, I looked at. I mean, I didn't go into the rest of the details of this, that particular uh, systematic analysis. So based on those two, this particular systematic analysis on toslizumab seems to be a reasonable analysis. But of course, remember that analysis, that systematic analysis is only looking at studies that have been done up to that point in time. There may be more studies coming in the future, in which case the systematic analysis also might might be different in future. So in, in summary, the critical appraisal is essential to combat information overload, identify papers that are clinically relevant and for continuing professional development. There are 10 standard common questions you should ask when you want to critically analyze a paper. What is the research question? What is the design of the study? Selection issues, outcome factors, study factors, confounders, statistical methods used in the study, the results, the conclusions, and the ethical issues that are con considered. So going back to the Kalama Sutra, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. I think that is a very good guidance for us to live by when we are clinicians who are trying to practice critical appraisal and practice evidence-based medicine. Thank you. I think the next speaker is Professor Kumara Mendis again for the final speech. Thank you all for staying with us uh, for nearly I think three and a half hours or more. I will take maybe just 15 minutes to uh, do the last presentation. 
and uh, just one bit of information there was a question asked uh, whether the SLMA can give you a certificate of attendance. Uh, I have uh, clar I, I, I have asked uh, the secretary, uh, Dr. Sumitra, and yes, we can. Uh, we'll be looking at the uh, Zoom attendance, and uh, the SLMA will be uh, issuing a certificate of attendance. So that's the first of your questions answered. So in this brief presentation, EBM in the era of COVID, can we really practice it? We are just, I'll be touching very briefly with the issues, limitations and solutions. In, in, in my initial presentation, when we concluded it, we admitted that there are issues with EBM. It is not a, a, a mathematically uh, provable, 100% plausible uh, uh, technique. As you know, medicine is itself is an applied science only. We just can't com compare ourselves with mathematics and physics, right? So in this, having this con context, issues and limitations, just to name a few, the evidence-based quality mark has been misappropriated by Western interest. That is, they, ha they have distorted the evidence-based brand. I will give some e examples. And uh, the famous uh, professor from Stanford has said, EBM has been hijacked by pharmaceutical companies. Yes, it is. So don't blame the, the, uh, the method but blame the people who uh, manipulated this. But we have to also take some blame. Statistically significant benefits may be marginal in clinical practice. I have just heard a few examples uh, that going into. You can prove a statistical significance by, you know, just a few uh, uh, statistical manipulations, but that does not mean it is clinically significant and patient oriented results. That's the other thing. So evidence-based guidelines often map poorly to complex multimorbidity and the volume, especially the guidelines has become unmanageable. And in the end, can we practice EBM in the COVID-19 era? I will just give one example of this and we have to be really, really careful. So distortion of the evidence-based brand there are huge number of articles, but increasingly, one of the best examples that we can give is uh, the pharmaceutical industry. They can't do this alone with uh, clinical and academic people, create diseases that are, you know, have very little significant uh, importance to give you just one of, of uh, example, from DSM-4 to DSM-5, right? When the, uh, uh, the number of diseases increased so much in DSM-5, right? People woke up to DSM-5 and thaw, uh, saw that they were having some psychiatric illness, right? It was so much that the chairperson who uh, chaired the uh, DSM-4, he declined to chair the same DSM-5 because there were so many new diseases created, okay? And two examples are female sexual arousal disorder treatable with sildenafil and male baldness treatable with finasteride. So the pharmaceutical industry so manipulates, they also decided which tests and treatments will be compared in empirical studies and choose often surrogate. What is a surrogate measurement? So the best example we can give is the statins. By, give statin, by giving statins, we can demonstrate the decreasing cholesterol levels. It does not mean anything very much. Right. If you want to really go for patient-oriented outcomes, 
you have to demonstrate that it decreases, increases the lifespan, right? Without telling that any drug can be given and they can demonstrate we lower the cholesterol. It may not do anything for the lifespan or heart attacks or anything. So that's a very simple uh, example of a surrogate. So surrogate value, surrogate uh, uh, things are very, very uh, attractive to pharmaceutical industries. But death, whether you are alive or not, not very, they don't like that kind of uh, outcome measures and it takes time to prove that. Okay, so this is the, the two studies that have been done, we give as example, and proven, I mean, then you get a huge number of so-called trials coming out to prove this, right? So distorting the brand of evidence base because they say this is the evidence behind it. Overpowering trials, this is another technique that they use to ensure that small differences will be statistically significant, setting the inclusion criteria to select those who are likely to respond to treatment and manipulating the dose of both intervention and the control drugs, using again surrogate endpoints and selectively publishing positive results. Now, this is a very important publishing technique. They publish only the positives. Industry may manage to publish its output as unbiased studies leading to peer reviewed uh, in leading peer reviewed journals. Again, we'll just go into this is a very nice study why olanzapine beats respiridone and respiridone beats quetiapine and that beats olanzapine and explorative analysis of head to head comparison. Now, this kind of study confuses a lot of people. But it's published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Another good example of selective publication. This is a very important article. One review of industry sponsored trials of antidepressants showed that out of 38, 37 with positive findings, but only 14 out of 36 with negative findings were published. And you see all the uh, publications that had negative findings were not included. So the total weightage is on what it said on the positive studies. I could not resist including this. We have made an application. It is, if you, uh, we will uh, allow you to uh, allow the access to the studies. We have put on a database, I think now we have 128 clinical guidelines produced by Sri Lankan colleges, institutes, Ministry of Health, and all others. You can search by disease, you can search by anything, and you will be pointing out to the relevant guideline. For example, for diabetes, there are four or five different colleges producing guidelines. I don't want to name them. These are not, uh, our database will point to the relevant college. Very few comply with even the basics of what Shehan told that should be in a guideline. So this is the state of situa situation. And in the COVID era, how even the Ministry of Health produce guidelines, it is only second to, second to gazette not notifications. You know how get, gazette notifications in our country, they publish one thing in the morning and in the evening, it is overridden by another gazette. So it has come to that level. So we just can't call them guidelines. This is my point of view, right? It can be circular, circular by Ministry of Health. That is okay. Can we practice EBM in the COVID era? I'll share with you some of the key articles. There are two or three articles. This is one of the top articles, very readable, quick, 
evidence based medicine and covid 19 what to believe and when to change superb article and it describes how the knowledge translation during a pandemic has crashed what do we mean by knowledge translation normally we do observational studies maybe or qualitative then we are come on to clinical trials and then randomized trials and then over time we collect the randomized randomized controlled trials and do systematic reviews and meta analysis and then come into guidelines it takes time it takes money it takes numbers to do this population as you heard during the previous lectures of the study designs it all have crashed because there's so little time right so but can we hold our decision until the systematic reviews come on no we just can't so this is why you got a good dose of critical appraisal which is very very basic i was so pleased uh, to hear from shamila even i uh, 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 got some points because these are very basic things that's not high end stuff at all you don't to me don't need to be a statistician or epidemiologist to do this kind of thing right you know the basic facts download the 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 structured format from the all are free there's nothing for you to pay and you come to your own conclusion i will end this with but this very disturbing so these are all uh, uh, even nature how he described the medicines evidence pipeline is broken and uh, the famous uh, man from stanford who says i think 90% of all clinical trial uh, evidence uh, articles are uh, not correct statistically he has proven john i don't know how it pronounce uh john p a yonides it's a greek person very interesting man and wasted research they have done so much of research that one of these editorials describes how poor the quality are and we depend we have to depend on these trials to make uh, decisions and as you know the medics iv supun uh, told if you can see the small letters this is this was about 1 hour ago there are 18429 articles without peer review on this server right just a few hours i think 1 hour ago and clinical trials gov this was about one day on covid there are ongoing 6367 studies put to this clinical trials cup i don't know how many of our studies go into this they do these studies but so can you see what kind of research input is being put into this so pandemic trials evidence based medicine on steroids you know what steroids do we manage temporarily because we don't have any other thing right right during delivering evidence based care during covid there are methods this is very uh, interesting article how journals maintain standards jama has produced a very nice article on this uh, because it they are under high pressure to publish quickly and one of the things that they have done correctly is this recovery trial it's a fantastic effort of getting a huge population and following them up following them up with various treatments so if you are wondering whether we have done anything correct there are at least a few things that we have got it right i think i have come to the uh, the last few slides very important although we are 6 minutes late listen to uh, listen to this why you need to be able to at least do a basic appraisal of an unpublished or published article i am going to take you back a few years 
my question is can repeat history repeat itself we are on the verge of having this so i start go go back to tammy flu 2003 united states added this drug tammy flu to its strategic national stockpile first outbreak avian flu 2004 uk announces it will stockpile 14 million doses of ostelmeyer and cochrane review concludes that this drug reduces complications and symptoms in seasonal flu cochrane remember this right then 2009 flu uh, the who declared a flu pandemic 2009 bmj publishes critical cochrane update now this is the fact that we have to admit we do certain things and when we review it in a few years we find it it is not correct okay so the bmj published the critical cochrane update review of oseltamivir and then the european medicines agency in 2011 released 20000 pages of data that was not previously released and the gsk and roach released trial data on senemavaya and ostelmivir now these are companies that fought to keep their own data they were pressurized so much they had to release and see what happens 2014 cochrane review finds insufficient evidence that oseltamivir reduces lower respiratory complications or impedes transmission complete turnaround generic formulation of this drugs were available now the key thing who who gave the initial go for the stockpiling or the approval after the fda downgrade status it took can you see the the number of years that it took 2005 to 2017 this is because cochrane collaboration certain people find the lawsuit they have uh, uh, given a lawsuit against uh, the uh, drug manufacturers it is it was done in 2020 my the next slide will show the similarities just now we are facing the companies roach fda first approved who approves secondly i have to tell this is not doing anything to the world health organization this is the guiding light on that approval panel there were two individuals who did not declare their interest they were previous roach workers this is top guideline approval facility now this is the meb era biologicals are coming right these are two i got this from prof shamila's presentation this is a scoping review by bmc a journal and this is 2021 may cochrane review if you can i will read quickly the cochrane review on average tolizumab is it correct tolizumab yeah tolizumab reduces all cause mortality at d28 21 days compared to standard care alone or placebo and probably results in slightly fewer serious adverse effects than standard care alone or placebo nevertheless tolizumab probably results in little or no increase in outcome clinical improvements defined as hospital discharge or improved measures by trialis defined scales at day 22 28 the impact of solisinomab on other outcomes is uncertain or very uncertain with the data available this is a systematic review which was done in may to 2021 so they go on to tell the findings of this review will be updated because this is a live uh, live review of cochrane as 
new data is being so can you see the rate of fda approvals and the next slide will be i think the last one just think will history repeat itself tolisum manufactured by roth roach approved by fda even available in sri lanka the last price of the single dose was 130000 150000 but blame it on the rupee value because the rp is coming down uh, who has approved it for treatment of covid 19 the fact that i was just looking at up to date the recent guideline automatically when i ask for covid 19 treatments they tell me there is a cocktail with two meds and another uh, biological has been approved for primary care in fda and already australia has approved it where are we going will it be even in sri lanka where we have to have oxygen more than anything else i am sure that in few months they will say this was a we didn't have enough data but we are talking about huge hugely costly drugs when we do not have even a clear plan for increased supply i hope and pray we don't go into that scenario so this is the thing just a few minutes ago i was trying to access up to date i have a license copy not the copy that some of us are using so can you see monoc monoclonal antibody treatment for outpatients with mild to moderate covid 19 just few minutes ago this was coming up even in the best of pre appraised tools that we have up to date so can you see the cocktail and sotorovimab are both recommended in united states manufactured in united states and approved in united states we look at the fda and say right fda is approved and you can bet your last dollar in the next few weeks the who will approve this and then it will be worldwide so in this workshop i this is my last slide we started with just to recap in 5 minutes we started with what is evidence based medicine and we went on to the study designs and how to structure your question using a pico by dr merilu then dr supun got that question and tried a few available research uh, search engines almost all no google google scholar and he introduce one very specific medical search engine called trip it is you can use it as a free version and also a pubmed from that uh, dr shehan went on to uh, the discussion of how we discuss uh the differences between various you know systematic reviews meta analysis and narrative reviews we all like narrative reviews but is how reliable are they and explaining the risk to patients that we i i think that's the area that we neglect very much and then prof shamila ended up with a very practical useful thing useful skill set all the pgim trainees require this kind of thing at any not even pgim trainees now that's not my concern but if we are to understand any of this uh findings that are being bombarded at us at a rate we have to have some kind of basic knowledge like what she presented so i end with this quotation by cochrane in particular i believe kio is rare and the need for kio is widespread 
and the pursuit of Kyo at all costs may restrict the supply of care. This is the same person who was the prison doctor in 1940s and then later became the head of Medical Research Institute, UK, and the person who initiated the value of randomized control trial and cochlear collaboration. So with this, uh, we open for any questions. We will try to uh, answer any questions that you have put on the chat already. And no questions at the moment. Only come there. <laughs> so uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, concerned if you don't have questions. Because the, I, I think there are only two options if you don't have questions. We have been such a good audience or you have not understood the topic, either of those, right? It is normally the previous one, right? So any question you can ask, if, you, if we can, we will just uh, uh, answer. I'll uh, invite uh, Prof. Shamila also. Any other questions uh, you can put to the uh, chat? Supun, see whether, no. So thank you very much for staying with us for half, uh, four hours and eight, 15 minutes. And we will be uploading uh, Vihanga and thank you all for the uh, SLMA staff, Vihanga, Raja and the office staff for making this possible when the lockdown is on and uh, we could not do this from our homes. That is 100%. Confidence intervals are very narrow in that. So, and uh, also the uh, SLMA Council and the President and Dr. Chaturi, uh, everyone who gave us the option of presenting this. This, uh, Vihanga, the video will be available on the YouTube channel, yes. The SLMA has a YouTube channel, so it will be uh, available and we will also make the slides uh, uh, because I know it's a huge uh, four hour uh, YouTube video, but we will upload the separate slides in the SLMA, SLMA web possible. Yeah. Okay. Or else I'll, ha I have my web website. You can see the website. I will make this uh, all of us uh, the presentation. Thank you very much again and stay safe and see you uh, during the, I think next will be the sessions. There are pre-Congress is over. Please uh, register for the SLMA sessions and we'll see you there. Thank you very much.